answers the way that they have outlined they're going to well, handle it? We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Obviously, I think uh, the, the, the more aggressive we can be, the more complete we can be, the more bipartisan we can be, the better we can be. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. This morning, a congressional committee looked at the FBI's use of informants, focusing on the case of Boston organized crime figure James Whitey Bulger. Today's lone witness is the brother of Mr. Bulger, University of Massachusetts President William Bulger. The House Government Reform Committee has been conducting a two-year investigation into the issue. This is just over four and a half hours. The committee will come to order and I will begin. We're here today to receive testimony from William Bolger. During the 107th Congress, the committee conducted an investigation of the FBI's misuse of informants in New England from 1964 until the present. The committee held a number of hearings and conducted hundreds of interviews under the leadership of then Chairman Dan Burton. Mr. Bolger's testimony is the next step of the committee's investigation into the use of informants by the Department of Justice. James Whitey Bolger was an informant for the FBI in Boston. Whitey Bulger was repeatedly able to avoid arrest due to information illegally leaked to him by his FBI handler, John Conley. When Whitey Bulger was finally indicted in 1995, he received advance warning from Conley and fled. Federal and state authorities continue to look for him. Whitey Bulger is currently wanted on 18 counts of murder, as well as other racketeering offenses, some of which were committed during his tenure as an FBI informant. He is currently listed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. As a result of John Conley's improper relationship with James Bulger, Conley was convicted of racketeering and obstruction of justice and is now serving a 10-year prison sentence. I don't believe it's a coincidence that current FBI Director Bob Mueller recently asked former Attorney General Griffin Bell to conduct a review of the FBI's Office of Professional Responsibility. The revelations about John Conley's conduct call into serious question the deterrent value of the FBI's internal review process. Conley grew up in the same South Boston neighborhood as the Bolger family. As an adult, John Conley was a friend of James Bolger's brother, William. William Bolger served as president of the Massachusetts Senate from 1978 to 1996 and is currently the president of the University of Massachusetts. Pursuant to subpoena, William Bolger appeared before this committee on December 6, 2002. At that time, Mr. Bolger exercised his Fifth Amendment privilege and refused to testify. On April 9, 2003, this committee voted to grant William Bolger immunity to obtain information concerning Whitey's whereabouts and the FBI's misuse of informants. The purpose of this hearing is to get to the truth about the impact that the misconduct of John Connolly had on the proper functioning of state government in Massachusetts. The record of this committee's investigation plainly establishes that the FBI's improper relationship with its informants corrupted and distorted the efforts of state law enforcement. Joseph Salvati went to prison for 30 years for the Deegan murder when the FBI had evidence that Salvati was not the killer. This hearing, however, will focus on whether the relationship between John Connolly and Whitey Bulger benefited Whitey Bulger's brother, William Bulger, while he was a high-ranking elected official in Massachusetts. The issues include whether, as a result of that relationship, the FBI improperly protected or advanced Mr. Bolger's career during his tenure in the Massachusetts legislature. Whether Mr. Bolger used his position of power to retaliate against those who investigated Whitey's crimes. Whether Mr. Bolger knew of the relationship and sought, or at least knew that he received, favorable treatment as a result of the relationship. And finally, whether Mr. Bolger has knowledge on James' whereabouts and the efforts of the FBI to locate his, his brother. Getting to the truth about these issues will reassure the public that these matters have been thoroughly and fairly investigated and contribute to the restoration of public confidence in government. The disclosure of the improper relationship between John Conley and James Bolger has cast a new light on events involving William Bolger. The committee will examine whether the investigation and prosecution of former Senate Majority Leader Joseph DiCarlo on federal corruption charges was intended to benefit Mr. Bolger, who became Senate President following that scandal. The committee will also examine whether Mr. Bolger has any information regarding allegations that John Connolly sought to terminate prematurely an investigation of possible 
corruption in connection with the 75 State Street matter, a real estate development project in the 1980s. The Committee will ask whether Mr. William Bolger had any connection in the demotion of a Massachusetts State Police officer who in September of 1987 filed an incident report regarding an attempt to stop Whitey Bolger at Logan Airport after $500,000 was discovered in his bag. The officer, Billy Johnson, later committed, committed suicide. Mr. Johnson claimed his superior requested a copy of this incident uh, report regarding James Bolger on behalf of William Bolger. The committee will also examine whether Mr. Bolger was aware of an amendment to the state budget that would have required state police officers 50 or older to take a reduction in pay, in rank, or retire. The amendment, which was later vetoed by the governor, would have only affected five officers in Boston. Two of the five officers had participated in the Lancaster Street garage investigation involving Whitey Bolger and other leaders of the Boston mob. The misuse of informants in Boston has left an indelible mark on the public's perception of the FBI. The Department of Justice was supposed to enlist the use of informants to apprehend and prosecute high-ranking members of the mob. Instead, certain FBI special agent handlers in Boston, including John Conley, chose to break the law by participating in corrupt relationships with their informants. The agents turned a blind eye to the crimes committed by their informants and participated in dismantling state and federal investigations of the New England mob by tipping off their informants to wiretaps, surveillance, and pending indictments. The agents chose personal gain over ethics by forming social relationships with their informants that exceeded the boundaries established by FBI guidelines. The agent handlers accepted personal and monetary gifts from their informants. This committee will examine all of these issues to gain a full understanding of the serious impact of FBI's misconduct in the case. Only by having a full understanding can we take steps to make sure that it never happens again. I now recognize our ranking member, Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I welcome this opportunity to hear from uh, uh, William Bulger and to give him a chance to answer the committee's questions in a public session. This is the tenth day of hearings on law enforcement abuses related to the Boston office of the FBI. During the committee's hearings, we have learned that the FBI profoundly abused the public trust. It is now beyond dispute that agents in the Boston office of the FBI protected organized crime uh, figures who committed murders and other violent crimes, helped send innocent people to jail, warned suspected criminals of impending indictments, accepted bribes, and committed other illegal acts. The person alleged to be at the center of much of this illegal conduct is James Whitey Bulger, Bulger, who was now one of the ten most wanted fugitives in the United States. Whitey Bulger is accused of committing multiple murders and running a brutal criminal organization in New England. Almost like the biblical parable of Cain and Abel, his brother, William Bulger, took a completely different path. He became a major political figure in Massachusetts and the president of its public university. William Bolger is here today to answer questions about whether he has information on the whereabouts of his brother Whitey, whether he was involved in or knew about the corrupt relationship between his brother Whitey and the former FBI Special Agent John Conley, and whether he used his public office to protect his brother or to protect himself from various law enforcement investigations. I welcome the opportunity to explore these questions with Mr. Bolger. But I would add one final point before we proceed. When the committee considered granting Mr. Bulger immunity in April, I gave my support reluctantly because I was concerned that Mr. Bulger not sing be singled out for political purposes. I still have some of those concerns given the ongoing political disputes brewing in Massachusetts. But I'm guided by Justice Brandeis's off-quoted statement Sunshine is the best disinfectant. Questions have been raised about what Mr. Bulger knows. It is in everyone's interest, even Mr. Bulger's, for these questions to be answered in public. And perhaps most important, the families of the victims of Whitey Bulger need to know that no effort has been spared to find the truth. I look forward to hearing Mr. Bulger's testimony today. Yield back my time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh gentleman from Indiana who uh, started these investigations has played a very active role, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I'm glad we finally are able to get on with this. Two years ago, uh, Joel Salvati and his wife sat at that table, and uh, they spent 30, he spent 30 some years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And uh, we found out that all the way up to J. Edgar Hoover, it was pretty apparent that he was innocent and they were protecting informants. And that's because our government uh, let them down. The FBI was protecting a killer named Jimmy Fleming, and it didn't matter to even the people at the highest levels of the FBI that innocent people were going to prison and possibly going to die in prison. We've learned a lot since Joe and Marie Savati were here. When we started, we had a suspicion that terrible things had happened. Now we have some more facts. Facts about innocent men who were left to die in prison so that government informants could go free. Facts about Joe the Animal Barboza who lied for the government and who was protected while he committed crimes, including murder, after he went into the witness protection program. Facts about Paul Rico, his sordid conduct as an FBI agent, and his subsequent career as an organized crime facilitator at World High Lie, where some have testified he helped murder Roger Wheeler. Facts about John Conley and some of his corrupt FBI cronies in Boston who didn't seem to care that their informants were out killing people. And finally, facts about Stephen the Rifleman Fleming and James Whitey Bulger who were allowed to murder with impunity. The story is so sickening, it's easy to lose sight of the forest for the trees. Today, however, we have an opportunity to step back and look at the big picture. And it's my sincere hope that this will be a positive step in the committee's investigation. I've called what happened in Boston one of the greatest failure or the greatest failure in the history of federal law enforcement. In two years, no one has come up with an example that is half as bad as what happened in Boston. And I think that the government owes the people of New England an apology. But the fault cannot be put exclusively on the federal government. Perhaps as important, there was a climate in Boston that permitted Joe Barboza, Jimmy and Stevie Fleming, and Whitey Bulger to get away with murder, multiple murders, literally. And to understand this climate, we have to talk to people like Whitey Bulger's brother, Billy Bulger, who was president of the Senate. For over 30 years, Boston was living the fable of the emperor's new clothes. I'm sure we all know that fable. Remember the story about an arrogant leader who spent his money on new clothes, and then one day two rogues came to him and commissioned a new suit, and he was told that the clothes would be invisible to all who were unfit for his office or simple of character. And when the emperor finally was presented with nothing, he could not admit that he could not see the suit, and his followers were too scared to admit they saw nothing, so the emperor paraded through the streets wearing no clothes. Finally, a little child said, but the emperor has nothing on at all. In Boston, two of the rogues were Stevie Fleming and Whitey Bulger. The appearance of being the emperor was William Bulger. And the question is, did he know what the rogues were doing? Was he protecting in any way what the rogues were doing? It's hard to conclude after the investigations that we've conducted over the last couple of years that he did not. People knew that Bulger and Fle Fleming were criminals. They knew about the bookmaking, bookmaking and the loan sharking. They knew about drug dealing and gun running, and some even knew about the murders. But for some reason, nothing seemed to happen. People could not bring themselves to speak the truth. Now we know why. They were scared. They were terrified, and many still are. They were terrified because the local establishment tolerated Whitey Bulger and Stevie Fleming. It facilitated their conduct. It enabled them. And no one seems to doubt that William Bulger through the example, he said, played a major role in helping his brother stay on the streets. William Bulger did not describe his brother in front of hundreds of people at his cherished St. Patrick's Day festivities as the reverend because he thought he was a good man. He did it because he knew that no one would question him. He knew they would laugh with him. Everyone was in on the joke, but it wasn't a joke. Ask Debbie Davis's family. Ask Joe and Marie Salvati. Ask David Wheeler, who told this committee about how his dad was killed. Making light of, quote, the reverend speaks volumes about why we're here today. And now people are coming forward and years of silence is being broken. But we're far from finished. We have a lot of work to do, and I hope that Chairman Davis will devote the time and energy to going forward with this investigation. We still have not seen the Bulger or Fleming informant files, and we need the chairman's help to, to get that done. 
It's taken several months, but we have Mr. Bulger with us, and I look forward to asking him about many things today, as well as my colleagues. And I hope that Mr. Bulger will be concise with his answers and, and not ramble on, because we have a lot of questions we'd like to get answered, and uh, we'd like them to be concise and as direct to, to the uh, answers posed as, as possible. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Any other members wish to give opening statements? Uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. All right. Let me uh, let me uh, let me start through. We'll go through seniority. Give an opportunity, Mr. Tierney. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the preceding chairman, Mr. Burton, for having these hearings on the FBI misconduct. For nearly 40 years, the FBI agents in Boston have recruited members of organized crime to act as bureau informants. Some of the same agents may have been recruited by organized crime, or in some odd zealousness to pursue information for criminal informants against other criminals. Some law enforcement FBI agents appear to have ignored or covered up criminal conduct of their informants to preserve cases against other targets. The result has been a corrupt system where FBI agents protected informants at the expense of innocent citizens. The FBI and possibly other Department of Justice people are now alleged to have been complicit in miscarriages of justice, where some went to jail on tainted evidence, where discretion about whether or not to investigate and prosecute certain cases was improperly exercised. This Oversight Committee has particular responsibility to determine the exact nature of these corrupt relationships, to identify all participants, however wide or deep or how high up the chain it went, to ensure that victims see justice done, and to implement any necessary guidelines at the Department of Justice or laws or rules and regulations that will be necessary to prevent any repeat in Boston or elsewhere. We're confronted with a new security dynamic where many are pressing for expanded law enforcement powers and less constitutional constraint on trespass against individual rights. Many people are concerned, and the facts such as those in this investigation give rise and voice to that concern. Is the FBI reliable enough to properly use any enlarged powers? Is the Department of Justice and ultimately Congress acting to ensure citizens' constitutional rights are protected? People need to know that the FBI agents will enforce the law and not undermine it. Already we've had hearings disclosing outrageous injustices and law enforcement's transgressions. We heard expert testimony about possible recourse to prevent future transgressions. From the United States Attorney General Reno's task force guidelines for prosecutors and law enforcement personnel to expert witnesses recommending a broadening of the obstruction of justice law to include suppression of evidence as a punishable act and extend beyond five years the statute of limitations relative to such offenses. One witness provoked thought with a recommendation that Congress should federalize far fewer criminal laws. This committee is charged with evaluating the effectiveness of current standards, of determining which of the above recommendations or others, if any, should be incorporated into new standards, and with issuing a full report on the extent and exact nature of the conduct forming the basis of this investigation. The latter aspect is where today's witness te testimony will, may be relevant. To the extent that this witness has information bearing on the FBI or other law enforcement personnel's misconduct, especially concerning the handling of confidential informants, or information of other misconduct, including cover-ups or inappropriate exercise of discretion in pressing cases, the testimony will be of interest and helpful to this investigation. Insofar as the witness now testifies under a grant of immunity, we have every right to expect that he will share any and all relevant information, that he will be direct, forthright, and honest, and if he does that, then we can all perform our responsibilities. I yield back the balance of my time. Um, thank you very much. Let me just say every member's statements will be included in the record. I also ask unanimous consent uh, that Mr. Meehan and Mr. Delahunt, who are not members of the committee, be allowed to participate in today's hearing. And hearing no objection, uh, so ordered. Uh, other members wish to make opening statements. Everything will be included in the record. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Delahunt. Yeah, if I may. Um, First, in terms of, uh, I have a need to disclose the fact that uh, Mr. Bulge's counsel, Mr. Kiley, uh, has represented myself uh, on a variety of uh, election issues and is currently the treasurer of uh, my own campaign committee. And uh, I presume, I have not heard from Mr. Kiley on this subject. Uh, and I clearly have not had any conversations with Mr. Bulger, but if there is any objection uh, to me participating in this hearing on behalf of Mr. Bulger, uh, I'd like to know that now. 
Uh, if I may, uh, Mr. Davis, yes. proceed with a statement. You may. Well, I was going to get Mr. Lynch first, though, because Certainly. he's a member of the committee. I didn't know. I deferred but, to my But you're, uh, there's my no colleague. objection. You're participating. We're happy to have you, and you're here at our invitation. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Davis, Mr. Waxman, and my colleagues on this committee, and invited members, Mr. Delahunt and Mr. Meehan of the Judiciary Committee, I'd like to begin by offering my thanks to the leadership of this committee, both Republican and Democrat, and both past and present, for the enormous effort that's been put forward to investigate and address what must be described as one of the most shameful and troubling chapters in the history of the U.S. Justice Department and the FBI. As a result of the good work of Federal District Judge Mark Wolf, which this committee has continued under the able leadership of Chairman Burton and, and also Jim Wilson, very able counsel who served this committee very well, and also now Chairman Davis and able counsel uh, Keith Osbrook and Mike Yeager, we have elicited and cataloged a 40-year history of unspeakable crimes and atrocities which were condoned, conducted, or materially assisted by the Boston office of the FBI. These atrocities include the murders of at least 19 individuals, 17 men and two women, some who've been retrieved from hastily dug graves, others who have yet to be found. The trail of law enforcement misconduct also includes the wrongful imprisonment of innocent men who spent 30 or more years in prison for crimes they did not commit. While the government had evidence that would exonerate them, they were allowed to remain in prison because to expose the false testimony of government informants like Joe Barboza and others would have jeopardized the convictions of La Cosa Nostra in New England, but I, but I think more importantly it would have jeopardized the careers of those law enforcement officials who advanced themselves as a result of, of the prosecution of La Cosa Nostra through the use of these same informants. The FBI, in league with their government informants, set forth a chain of events that spans 40 years. This crime spree saw the case of Brian Halloran, who had turned to the FBI for protection in fear of his own life. He was turned away by the FBI. And only a short time later, he and his friend Michael Donahue, who was an innocent bystander, and who had merely given Mr. Hallen a ride, were gunned down in cold blood in my own neighborhood of South Boston. Two other victims, Deborah Davis and Deborah Hussey, were only 26 years old when they were murdered by the very men that the FBI had chosen to protect. The record is replete with examples documented to obtain evidence against Whitey Bulger by law enforcement officials and also against Stephen Fleming and, and their cohorts. But time and again, wiretap locations and surveillance attempts were thwarted by Agent John Connolly and other agents of the FBI, who gave notice to their government informants of these attempts to bring them to justice, and so the killings continued. The reach of this group was extensive, reaching to Florida and Oklahoma, where businessman Roger Wheeler was shot in the face at point-blank range in a parking lot leaving behind a wife and young children. The families of these victims have come to these hearings regularly, seeking justice where justice can be done. Others are merely hoping for the chance to give their loved ones a decent burial. For most, for most of these families, especially for those members who were merely children when their family members were taken, justice under any fair description of that term is simply beyond reach. Lives have been destroyed and, in some cases, stolen. This is especially true for Mr. Joseph Salvati and his wife Marie and their children, as well as the Lamoni family and the Greco family and the Tamilio family. These families had to look on while their loved ones were sent to, sent to jail for a crime the FBI knew that they did not commit. And I would be remiss if I did not note the good work of Vincent Garrow, legal counsel to the Salvati family, who for these many years has maintained the highest standards of professionalism and vigilant legal advocacy on behalf of the man who was wrongly convicted. And in the reams and reams of testimony that we've received over the past two years, there was one conversation that sticks out in my mind, and it sort of captures the, the scope and the depth of the wrongdoing that we investigate here. It was a conversation between Mr. Garrow and uh, 
Joseph Salvati's youngest son, who I think was two years old when his dad went to prison. Some 30 years later, when Joseph Garo was a young man, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph Salvati was a young man, Mr. Garo had a conversation with, uh, with Joe Salvati's son, and he said, you know, you were only two years old when your dad went to prison, and you've sort of been the man in the family uh, for all these years. And he said, now it looks as though your, your, your dad is going to get out of jail, and when he gets out, he's going to want to be the man of this house. It was a, it was a moment of, it was a light moment in, in, a, in a history of darkness. And Joseph's reply was this. He said, Mr. Mr. Garrow, he said, I want you to know that I have never sat down and had breakfast with my father. I have never gone for a walk with my father. I have never gone to a baseball game with my father. And if when my father gets out of prison, he wishes to exercise his right to be the man of this house, then I'll be happy to allow him to do that. That conversation, probably for me, solidified the sense of wrongness that has been done here. As well, the special nature of the FBI wrongdoing that has gone on here. The American public, I think, has yet to, well, is probably just beginning to grasp the depth and the breadth of what really went on during the course of FBI misconduct. In fact, it is perhaps hard to grasp because the facts are so unbelievable. I was disappointed recently to, to read a court decision that prevented the, the Wheeler family from bringing suit against the FBI and law enforcement officials that, that law enforcement was culpable in the death of their father. They were told by the court that they should have brought their claims previously, that they should have known. They should have known. They should have known that the FBI was in league with organized crime? That's unbelievable. That defies the wildest imagination. And yet these people are being precluded from justice, precluded from any recovery because they did not know that the FBI was in league with organized crime. And yet we in government have empowered the FBI through our laws and through gov government regulations to operate in secrecy. And I hope at some point we will revisit the cases of these victims. Nevertheless, we only compound injustice when we seek to avoid the conflict of these offenses with the highest expectations of American democracy. When we simply wish it all to go away, to be over with. Because some of these events happened so long ago and have been concealed for so long. But it remains essential to the highest ideals of our system of justice and to the fabric of constitutional democracy that the Congress and this committee fulfill its responsibility to the victims in this case and also to the institutions of government that have been so maligned. We must continue to address this outrage honestly and in a spirit of justice that has been for so long denied. It is an admitted fact that certain agents and supervisors of the FBI recruited and employed criminal informants in order to undermine the New England La Costa Nostra. And that in the course of cultivating and employing these informants, these FBI agents became corrupted themselves. This corruption included agents who took cash, bribes, totaling thousands of dollars from the same criminals who have been indicted in at least 19 murders. I think it is very important for the members of this committee to be mindful that the Justice Department itself is charged with upholding and enforcing the laws and that we as lawmakers have passed those laws and supported regulations which give the FBI an enhanced ability to operate in secrecy. Moreover, we have so empowered the FBI and the Justice Department that local and state law enforcement authorities have been and can be in the future intimidated and obstructed in the pursuit of justice when, as in this case, the FBI asserts jurisdiction. In the course of this investigation, we have seen citizens murdered because they turned to the FBI for protection. If we were examining actions of the KGB in the Soviet Union during the Cold War, or if we were condemning the butchery of secret police in some struggling third world country, 
we would instinctively, when we read about those atrocities, we instinctively would take comfort in the protections of our constitutional government. I think it's generally the case when we read about things like that, we say to ourselves, thank God that couldn't happen here. Well, it happened here. It happened here. And we've got to wake up to that fact. The American, the American public has yet to wake up to the fact, but we have witnessed in these committee hearings a collapse of certain constitutional protections. In constitutional terms, this is like a 40-year sinkhole, a period where the underpinnings of democracy were allowed to decay, in which the individual protections guaranteed by our Constitution were subverted in the interest of pursuing La Cosa Nostra. Ultimately, this investigation is about the actions taken by the Justice Department and the FBI. It is not about the particular witness before us. By way of my own disclosure, today's witness and I each have the pleasure and honor of living in South Boston, a solid, patriotic, close-knit community where we all know each other. Mr. Bulger and I each shared the high honor of representing the good people of South Boston in Dorchester in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Similarly, we both served in the Senate and actually briefly served together in the Massachusetts legislature. And I have had the unique opportunity to witness Mr. Bulger's distinguished career of public service, one that, in my opinion, has met the highest professional standard of excellence. At the same time, growing up in the housing projects of South Boston, I also had opportunity, ample opportunity, to see families that were greatly harmed by the influence of organized crime and indirectly by the effects of the misdeeds by the FBI agents who protected those criminals. And in the end, we have an overriding responsibility and a sacred trust to protect those families and answer to those families as well. It may very well be, in the end, that this hearing is only marginally productive. Indeed, some of the areas of inquiry that we'll hear about today occurred some 35 or 40 years ago. However, it is the abiding principle of justice that now compels this committee to exercise due diligence and requires us to ask for every assist assistance in exploring to the fullest extent the FBI wrongdoing that is the core focus of these hearings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield at this time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, not a long statement, but just to say that, that I am truly stunned that the president of a major university system would feel it necessary to exercise his Fifth Amendment rights and, and say that he's only going to tell the truth if he's able to come before us with immunity. Uh, also, to thank Chairman Burton for his extraordinary work uh, previous to your very fine work, Mr. Chairman, and to thank you for following up. To thank Mr. Waxman uh, and uh, the Democratic colleagues for uh, our work on this committee on a very bipartisan basis, and to welcome our colleagues from Massachusetts who aren't on this committee. To say to you that I have still not gotten over how <clears throat> Mr. Salvati and his beautiful wife and family have had to deal with this issue and the failure of our government to right this wrong. Uh, and then to say, uh, in conclusion, that um, I'm going to defer questions on uh, Mr. Bolger to others and uh, listen to what he says to them under oath and with immunity. Uh, but I believe, without any hesitation, to say to you that uh, this is a story about corrupt law enforcement on the federal, state, and local level, but particularly the FBI. It's a story of political corruption, deep and serious, and it's a story of organized crime, and they all mix together in this incredible cocktail that resulted uh, in the Salvati spending 30 years of their lives uh, without each other. Um, I am grateful you had this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to make that statement. Uh, thank you very much. Again, uh, members will have five legislative days to get their remarks in the record, but members who feel compelled to speak will be uh, allowed to speak. Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very short statement. I welcome the continuation of this hearing from the 107th Congress. I'd also like to applaud the committee for its in-depth work in helping to uncover important facts concerning the FBI's tactics. 
and its previous use of informants in the Boston area. The use of informants by law enforcement is as old as law enforcement itself. Today's hearing, hopefully, will play a part in the restoration of public confidence in law enforcement matters. We know a few facts surrounding the investigation of Whitey Bulger, and one of them is that John Con Conley, uh, Whitey Bulger, and today's witness, William Bulger, lived close to each other as children in South Boston. Uh, and, and on April the 9th, 2003, this committee voted to grant today's witness, William Bulger, immunity to obtain information concerning the whereabouts of his brother, Whitey. Mr. Chairman, this is some of what we know so far. Uh, however, after we have had an opportunity to formally question today's witness, I am certain this committee will learn much more and move closer to uncovering the rest of the truth about Whitey Bulger. Finally, I would encourage this committee to remember that William Bulger is not on trial and should not be treated as such. He is only guilty of being the brother of a man that, that does not have the same respect for the law as he does. Hopefully he will share with us what he knows about his brother's former associates, illegal activities, and whereabouts. And I ask unanimous consent to submit my entire statement in its entirety into the record, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Without objection, uh, so ordered. Uh, I was going to get Mr. Any other members of the committee wish to be recognized? If not, let me get to Mr. Delahunt and then to Mr. Meehan. I know this is a great concern to, to both of you. Gentlemen. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, as others have indicated, the committee has focused now for many months on the operation of the Boston office of the FBI. And as others have indicated, there have been a number of profoundly disturbing revelations as to the misconduct and questionable practices that span decades in that particular office. It's been established clearly that information in the possession of the FBI could have exonerated innocent men who have served, who did serve more than 30 years each for crimes that the FBI knew they did not commit. And yet the Bureau never felt the need to come forward with that information. And as importantly, information was withheld from state and local law enforcement, as well as other federal agencies that put individuals and communities at risk from some of the most violent criminals in this country's history. Some murders might not have occurred if the Bureau had fulfilled its responsibilities to be more forthcoming. It's important to remember that Joe Barboza was relocated to California, and there was testimony that was taken by this committee from state and local authorities that established that they had never received any notification of Mr. Barboza's presence in their community. And while there, Mr. Barboza committed a murder. And then, while serving time for that particular homicide, federal authorities intervened in his behalf before the parole board. I think we all can agree that that is unacceptable and unconscionable. And that's why the work of this committee over the course of 10 public hearings now uh, has been so essential. And I really want to commend the former chair, uh, Mr. Burton. Um, he has been accused in, in the past of being a partisan. But it was Dan Burton that took on his own administration to threaten the Attorney General of the United States with contempt unless the documents that this particular committee was seeking were provided to the committee. And I know he can speak for himself, but again, I don't believe we have received the kind of cooperation from the Department of Justice that this committee should have and that the American people deserve. 
But my concern isn't limited to the conduct of the FBI just simply in Boston. It goes beyond that. As Senator Grassley uh, of Iowa has said, a culture of concealment that has eroded the confidence of the American people in the FBI and in the Department of Justice reflects what the FBI is about. And unfortunately, at a, the moment in history when the American people yearn for confidence in their Justice Department, given the events of September 11th, but it does go far beyond just the office in Boston. All we have to do is remember that back in the 1960s, information that would have assisted in the prosecution of those responsible for the church bombings in Alabama was not disclosed. Questions surrounding the work done in the FBI laboratory, the so-called jewel matter, where an individual is identified as responsible for the bombing during the course of the Atlanta Olympics, and the case was never moved forward. And to the recent prosecution of Wen Ho Lee, where a federal district court judge apologized to Mr. Lee on behalf of the American people because of the work of the FBI. So this is not just about the Boston office of the, MBI, of the FBI. In the four terms that I've been here, the most astounding testimony I've heard from any witness was presented last December in Boston during the course of a field hearing. And in response to a question from my friend and colleague to my left, uh, Mr. Meehan, Jeremiah O'Sullivan, former U.S. attorney, former head of the Organized Crime Strike Force, who knows the FBI well, made this statement. If you go against the FBI, they will try to get you. They will wage war on you. Please reflect on that statement, my colleagues. This is a culture that requires radical surgery. It can't stand, and what is necessary, as others have suggested, is transparency where appropriate and accountability. And with that, I yield back and I thank the chair for the invitation. Okay, um, Mr. Meehan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I too want to thank uh, the chair and the former chair for their work in this matter. Uh, Congressman Delahunt and I, uh, ba way back as uh, early as 1998, had requested uh, that the House Judiciary Committee uh, conduct hearings given our jurisdiction over the Justice Department. And uh, frankly, it took uh, courage and perseverance uh, to, uh, to hold these hearings. Uh, no one likes to have a hearing on the FBI, knowing that the FBI is not going to be too happy about the outcome of it. But I'm going to tell you something. The results of this hearing and the misconduct at the Bo Boston FBI office is just absolutely incredible. And I know, as a former prosecutor from personal experience, that informants make a significant and indeed an essential contribution to federal, state, and local law enforcement efforts. Informants have been extremely useful in organized crime cases uh, in that it's a way to inf infiltrate. It's a way that you get rats within the organization to provide information. That having been said, the events in Boston certainly demand that this Congress needs greater scrutiny. Uh, Attorney General uh, of the United States testified before the Judiciary Committee uh, 10 days or so ago, looking for broader powers under the Patriot II Act, uh, more secrecy uh, it, under the uh, guise of we have to protect the United States from terrorism. We had better not give any more authority to the FBI or any law enforcement agency until we clear up the culture that is so evident in the case that's before us. Whitey Bulger was a government informant and is alleged to have committed eight murders while a government informant, while he was an informant for the government, and there's evidence to suggest that the FBI either knew about it or looked the other way. And if anybody needs more evidence of why we need to make sure we keep a focus on the FBI, just look at this morning's Boston Herald, 
where apparently uh, there are two individuals, employees of a uh, hotel in the Caribbean, uh, who say that they've seen Whitey Bulger. No one in St. Vincent has been interviewed by the FBI. None of the witnesses have been interviewed by the FBI. I have no idea why they haven't, but, but it makes me wonder uh, how aggressive this, uh, this pursuit is in the case. Now, I don't know if the witness before us has any information, should shed any light on this, but I just want to thank the chairman and the former chairman because the work that we were doing in terms of oversight of the FBI is important. Remember, J. Edgar Hoover was bugging Martin Luther King, not because he thought he may have committed a crime, but he wanted to embarrass him. There's all kinds of evidence to demonstrate that this Congress has a responsibility to make sure that this never happens again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. If there are no other further statements, I would remind members will have uh, till the end of the day to submit any statements for, for, the, for the record. Mr. Bolger, uh, it's the policy of the committee all witnesses be sworn before they testify. Would you please rise with me and raise your right hand? Tell me swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. you see that? Note for the record that Mr. Bolger is appearing before the committee pursuant to a subpoena issued by this committee and duly served by agreement by a facsimile on Mr. Bolger's lawyer on Tuesday. A copy of that subpoena will be placed in the record. Uh, Mr. Kiley, would you please introduce yourself for the committee? Thank you. Thank you for being with us. In order to allow time for more questions and discussion, uh, Mr. Bolger, we're going well, to give you an opportunity to make your opening statement. We won't hold you any time limit. This is, uh, I think, an important statement for you and for the committee. And again, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I appreciate the courtesies that you, the members of this committee, and the committee staff have uh, extended to me. I know this committee seeks to ensure that our law enforcement and criminal justice functions in an effective and appropriate manner, and I certainly applaud this effort. One of the most basic duties government faces is to provide for the public safety. Government's efforts must be unwavering. Public confidence, when it is shaken, must be restored. People must feel secure about their lives, and people must be able to trust their government. I understand that you have a specific interest in the activities of federal law enforcement officials in Massachusetts, and I will be happy to assist in any way. I know that you have questions about my brother, James Bulger, and I will answer those questions. With the Chairman's indulgence, I would like to offer a few words about my brother. Many words have been written about him, but few have been spoken by me. There are reasons why I have maintained a reticence on what for me is a difficult and painful subject. I recognize that my reluctance to comment has been vexing for some, and I also believe that it is responsible for some significant misunderstandings and misperceptions. So please allow me to speak plainly. I do not know where my brother is. I do not know where he has been over the past eight years. I have not aided James Bulger in any way while he has been a fugitive. Do I possess information that could lead to my brother's arrest? The honest answer is no. I had one very brief telephone conversation with my brother. It occurred in 1995 and has long since been disclosed to law enforcement officials. Truth to tell, over the years, I was unable to penetrate the secretive life of my older brother. He marched to his own drummer and traveled a path very different from mine. Jim had his own ways I could not possibly influence. The realities of the situation were such that his activities were, in fact, shrouded in secrecy. They were never shared with me. It would be unfair to impute to me knowledge of my brother's associations, knowledge that I did not have, do not have. Much has been made of that brief telephone call that I have mentioned, a call that has been a, become a topic of discussion because my grand jury testimony was released to a Boston newspaper in violation of federal law. Many people, including elected public officials, 
have offered opinions about what was said or what was not said. But few, if any, have spoken about the illegal leaking that underlies the discussion. Very few have questioned a system that allows a transcript of my grand jury testimony to be released to the Boston Globe, but not to me. This call occurred in 1995, six years before my grand jury appearance. The subject of my brother turning himself in never came up in that conversation. I never recommended that my brother remain at large. In 1995 and in subsequent years, I believed that the FBI wanted James Bulger killed. It has been established that an FBI agent, John Morris, in 1988, met with Boston Globe Spotlight Team editor Gerard O'Neill and told him that my brother was an informant, information that was summarily published in the Boston Globe. Morris's leak had one purpose, pure and simple, bringing about the death of James Bulger. And this is not just my hunch. This is the finding of U.S. District Court Judge Mark Wolf after extensive hearings. I know my brother stands accused of many things, serious crimes, brutal crimes. I do still live in the hope that the worst of the charges against him will prove groundless. It is my hope. I am particularly sorry to think that he may have been guilty of some of the horrible things of which he is accused. He has heard me often enough speak of society's right to protect itself and to impose severe penalties on anyone guilty of such deeds. I am mindful of the victims in this matter, and I do not have the words that are adequate to let them know of my own sympathy and anguish. But I am ever mindful of the Good Shepherd story and its lesson that no one is to be abandoned. I care deeply for my brother, but no one should construe my expression of concern as in any way condoning any illegal acts, nor should anyone think that I ever take lightly this entire matter. One political foe has made the claim that I have somehow made a choice of my brother over my civic duties and my public responsibilities. There is no basis, in fact, for such an assertion. I had, in fact, been concerned about the direction of my brother's life for many years. In truth, my effort with Jim spanned the decades. My attempts to change my brother's life were unsuccessful. I wish that I could have achieved success. But I must tell you that reforming Jim Bulger was not my sole 24-hour-a-day focus during the 30-year period spanning his release from prison during the mid-1960s through his departure in 1995. During that entire period, I served in the Massachusetts legislature I was honored to serve in the Massachusetts House of Representatives for 10 years and subsequently in the Senate for 25 years, elected by my Senate colleagues for nine terms as president of the Senate. Legislative duties as the demands of this committee, as the members, excuse me, of this committee can fully appreciate exact heavy demands. I met those demands. I made contributions during 35 years of legislative service authoring the first bill to require the reporting of child abuse, championing the cause of public education, public libraries, and advocating for the health and safety of my urban constituents. I kept faith with my constituents and with my colleagues. My wife and I were blessed with nine children, and early on I recognized that this was a place where my enemy energies must be focused. It was a responsibility I embraced. Our efforts have had a happy result. Those nine children have successfully completed and have been granted a graduate uh, and graduated from college, and six of them also completed graduate studies in the law and business and education. And our children are the parents of 24 grandchildren, some of whom are in my house on a daily basis. So while I never abandoned hope or abandoned my efforts with respect to my brother, the truth is that other important things were happening in my life. 
I never wrote my brother off or walled him off, but public service and my own immediate family placed very large claims on me. It is natural to focus our efforts on those matters that we can affect. And while I worried about my brother, I now recognize that I didn't fully grasp the dimensions of his life. Few people probably did. By definition, his was a secretive life. His actions were covert, hidden even from, or perhaps hidden especially from, those who loved and cared about him. The subject that interests so many, the life and the activities of my brother James, is painful and difficult for me. But it is a subject I've lived with for a long time. For years, my political opponents, my detractors in the press, and my adversaries in public debate have tried to use my brother in a cynical and calculated way in order to gain advantage. I first sought political office in the year 1960. Be assured that the subject of my brother was contentious from the start. On the occasion of my first speech, a political uh, foe told me that I should, quote, be in jail, unquote, with my brother. And it has been a refrain for 40 years. Among the constituents in my legislative district and in the Massachusetts Senate, there was always an awareness of my brother. It was never a secret. But people understood that we were different people who lived different lives and should be judged separately. When I was elected president of the educational institution, I am privileged to lead the University of Massachusetts. The members of the Board of Trustees knew of this circumstance in my life. Yet they judged me on my own merits, and they have my lasting gratitude. Now I am in a much larger arena where the audience is so vast that I cannot rely on its members having personal impressions of me as a basis for their judgments. I know that in some quarters I will no longer be seen or judged as an individual. I doubt that that happier time will ever return for me. But there is a reason to believe that a fairer perspective will surface again for those other family members who have shown great strength in the face of the onslaught by the media and by overzealous government authority. Thank you. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Mr. Bolger. With the concurrence of the ranking minority member and pursuant to Committee Rule 14, I will recognize the ranking minority and myself to control 30 minutes each. After this time, the committee will proceed under the five-minute rule. I recognize myself for 30 minutes. Mr. Bolger, your brother is accused of more than 20 murders. He led a life of crime for 30 years without being caught. One murder may have occurred at the house next door to yours. FBI agents apparently sat down for dinner there with mobsters, including one dinner at which you allegedly appeared. When Stevie the Rifleman Flemmy was arrested and the shed next door was searched, a large stash of weapons was discovered. You became Senate President following the federal prosecution of other Senate leaders. Former FBI agent John Morris, who was one of Whitey's handlers, has admitted that he took money from Whitey during the 75 State Street investigation. A former assistant U.S. attorney has testified that John Conley, now serving 10 years in jail for protecting Whitey, tried to terminate that investigation prematurely. My question is, did there come a time when you came to believe that the FBI had protected your brother and that John Conley may have used his authority to protect you or advance your political career? Uh, excuse me. My counsel informs me that I'm supposed to make a statement at this time, Mr. Chairman. That's correct. I understand from your staff that your procedures require me to reassert my privilege uh, under the Fifth Amendment in order to effectuate the order of Chief Judge uh, Hogan, and I do so at this time. Well, because you've refused to answer, I'm hereby no, I'm, I, uh, under, under your statement. Oh. We have to communicate to you an order issued by the uh, District uh, Court for the District of Columbia. The order provides in substance, you may not refuse to provide evidence to this committee on the basis of your privilege right. against self-incrimination. It provides that evidence obtained from you under the order uh, may not be used against you in any criminal proceeding. 
A copy of the order is at the witness table and without objection will be placed in the record. Pursuant to the order, uh, now you are directed to answer the questions uh, put to you. And this has been, we have previously uh, scripted this. Uh, Mr. Bulger, the immunity procedure is complete. Uh, I will repeat my question. Uh, did there come a time when you came to believe that the FBI had protected your brother and that John Connolly may have used his authority to protect you or advance your political career? Well, there are a couple of questions, Mr. Chairman. On the question of whether I, I, it came to, I came to the conclusion that there was, in fact, a relationship between the FBI and my brother. That is so. And I already alluded to the time that that uh, first uh, came to my attention. It was when uh, Mr. Morris uh, told uh, the newspaper and the newspaper printed it. And uh, that was later uh, construed by Judge uh, Wolf as an attempt by uh, Mr. Morris to uh, have my brother uh, killed. And uh, on the matter of uh, the second question of John Connolly uh, seeking to help me, I don't know of it especially the instance that you've um, referenced. But John was a friend of mine, and I assure you I never asked him to interfere in any such uh, procedures, never. Were you aware at the time that he may have done that, no, even though you didn't not. ask him? No. You became president of the Massachusetts State Senate following the prosecution of former Senate Majority Leader Joseph DiCarlo on federal corruption charges. Right. Uh, did you have any knowledge of the DiCarlo investigation before it became public? No, we knew that there was an invest I knew there was an investigation going on because it was in the press and it was in the general uh, rumor mill. Did you ever discuss the DiCarlo investigation with John Connolly? I don't believe I ever did. I have no recollection of ever speaking to John Connolly about that matter. But he was your friend at the time that was going he on. He was. Okay. In 1985, you received $240,000 from a trust fund uh, established by Tom Finnerty, uh, your law associate. The money came out of the same account in, into which Tom Finnerty had deposited $500,000 that he received from Harold Brown, a Boston real estate developer. Brown alleged that Finnerty extorted the $500,000 as part of the real estate venture for 75 states, State Street. As you're aware, we're here today to uncover as much information as possible about FBI misconduct in Boston and the, and the effect it may have had on state politics. You were cleared by both the federal and Massachusetts state government of any wrongdoing concerning 75 State Street. Even if you did not participate in extorting money from Harold Brown, there is still the underlying question of how the FBI agents who were your brother's handlers influenced the 75 State Street matter. Boston FBI Special Agent John Morris was the supervisor of the Public Corruption Crimes Unit during the time of the 75 State Street investigation. Morris formerly served as the supervisor of the Boston Organized Crime Squad. Morris testified under oath of taking gifts and money from your brother Whitey, including $5,000 in 1985. What did you know of that relationship between your brother Whitey and Special Agent Morris? I knew nothing of that relationship. Did Mr. you know Chairman. Special Agent Morris? I don't think I ever met him, but I'm, I've seen someplace that he claims I met him, but I do not recall such a meeting. May I make one further reference to Certainly. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, his name again is John Morris. Um, John Morris was disciplined uh, back in either 80, 1988 or 1989 because uh, I had volunteered to speak to the United States Attorney about this whole matter of that investigation. I was anxious to tell them my side of the uh, story. My attorney at the time asked the U.S. Attorney's people, please treat this with great confidentiality because I'm a public figure and it would be um, harmful to me. <coughs> uh, th and it was the United States Attorney's Office, a couple of counsel from that office. And also an FBI agent was seated at the table as I told my story. The very follow the next morning my phone rang, Mr. Chairman, and it was the Boston Globe, and they wanted to know how the interview had gone. 
my attorney was indignant about that. And so he called for uh, some kind of a, uh, an investigation of this episode and at the FBI. The FBI uh, did exactly that, and the conclusion was that John Morris had called the Globe about my interview. And that John Morris then was disciplined, you should know, for this behavior. I've written about that myself in some little political writings about the idea that um, I had gone through all of this with these people, and the only one who seems to be in trouble as a result of it is an FBI agent. And he was uh, suspended, I think, for several weeks for his uh, behavior. So that's my, unless I've met him at some point, which could be true too, then I, uh, that's my experience with John Morris. Okay. Did you ever discuss the 75 State Street investigation with Whitey? I don't think so. Okay. Um, what about with John Conley? A, f a former assistant U.S. attorney testified at John Conley's trial that Conley sought to prematurely terminate that investigation at 75 State Street. Did no, you ever never, discuss that I with Conley? I, never, I don't think I ever spoke on that subject uh, to John. I was very, I'm just talking more than, but I, I, I was very confident about my, uh, my position with respect to that. I didn't feel uh, as though um, there was anything for me to answer for, and I hoped for it to end. It went yeah. through three, I think, federal uh, investigations right. and two uh, state investigations, all of which it concluded by saying that uh, there was no accuser for me, number one, and that, that this was not a close call, and that was the state attorney general also. And I have an affidavit, uh, Mr. Chairman, which um, my attorney has provided for the, um, for the staff. And without objection, uh, we'll enter that into the record. This would be the Brown affidavit, Mr. Chairman. And without objection, that'll be put in the record. Let me ask another question. In, in September of 1987, your brother Whitey was stopped by uh, Lo Logan Airport personnel for attempting to carry $500,000 onto an airplane. Uh, State Police Trooper Billy Johnson detained and questioned Whitey at the airport with regard to that incident. Billy Johnson later wrote an incident report. Johnson claimed that soon after the incident, David Davis, the executive director of the Massachusetts Port Authority, came to Johnson's office and requested a copy of his report. Johnson stated that Dave Davis told him that you had asked Davis to obtain a copy of the incident report. Uh, Johnson was demoted after this incident, and he later committed suicide. Mr. Bolger, when did you first learn of the incident between Whitey and Billy Johnson at Logan Airport? I think the first I ever saw of it was when it was in, reported in the newspaper. And uh, I wish to assure you, Mr. Chairman, although you haven't asked, uh, that I have never, and did, I never made any call, I never sought to seek sanctions against uh, that uh, state trooper. He's doing his job. The, uh, I have an another affidavit which uh, my counsel has provided for your committee. And that affidavit is a recent one from David W. Davis himself. And he was a very respected, and is a very respected individual in Massachusetts, and he was the head of the Massachusetts Port Authority. Right. And he maintains exactly what I'm saying, that uh, there was no such communication from me. It has been reported a hundred times that there was, but there's no truth to it, none. Okay. Uh, Mr. Davis's affidavit only says that no one interceded with him for, Bo for, for Bulger, and no one else at Massport told him that uh, Bulger had contacted them. Uh, did he ask, uh, did we, uh, we didn't ask all the staff at Massport. And does Mr. Davis know whether Mr. Bolger ever received an incident report from another source within Massport? And we will go and verify that. I think we will go out and, and, and Excuse look Excuse me, that. sir? I just said we, we will go back and try to verify the affidavit. We've just been presented with that today, but I want to just okay. share that. Did, did you have a professional relationship? Yes. Will that affidavit be placed on the record, please? Uh, without objection, it will be put on the record. Uh, did you have a professional relationship with David Davis? Well, only that I was the president of the Senate, and he would be in touch from the, from the uh, Port Authority, almost with the same relationship I'd have with most agencies in, you know, in the Commonwealth. 
you know, close, it wasn't a close no, we personal very, relationship. No, we were not close. Not a social relationship? No, not at all. Um, did you tell Dave, David Davis to acquire Billy Johnson's incident report? Never. Did you tell anyone else who worked for Massport to acquire Billy Johnson's incident report regarding Whitey? No. No. Okay. And finally, my last line before I'm good yield to Mr. Burton. Um, when we have a vote going, so we may end up at this point, Mr. Burton, if, 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 after this line and then turn it over to you when we get back. Um, the Lancaster Street investigation was conducted by the Massachusetts State Police and targeted the leaders of the Boston mob, uh, which would have included your brother, Whitey. After the investigation was closed, an amendment was added to the state budget for fiscal year 1982, which would have required officers age 50 or older to take a reduction in pay and rank or retire. The amendment only affected five officers, two of which, John O'Donovan and John Regan, were involved in investigating Whitey. Were you aware of the Lancaster Street investigation before it was revealed to the public? No, I was not. Did you ever discuss the Lancaster Street investigation with John Conley? I don't think so. I I don't know. In fact, I just recently started to ask where this Lancaster Street site is. I don't know for certain where it is. D did you ever discuss the Lancaster Street investigation with your brother Whitey? Never. Did you know John O'Donovan? Pardon me? Did you know John O'Donovan, one of the officers? Oh, yes. And did you know John Regan? I don't think I knew John Regan. Okay. Now, did you sponsor the amendment in question? No. I can tell you I have no memory of the amendment, none whatsoever. And the... Uh, you don't remember discussing the amendment with anyone at this... Never. No. Before, how about after the fact? You, you. Uh, I don't recall... Because there was press on it, I think, later on. Press, I just but the press came much later, from what I understand. I have two affidavits from state police. Would you like those entered into the record? Yes. If I may. Uh, without objection. The affidavits of Agnes, Mrs. Agnes, and Nally, two of the other affected officers, please. Okay. Th th those will be entered in the record without objection. And then objection. They, they, by the way, offer a different take on the amendment. With about, well, I just, with 100,000 amendments. That I, I wonder, Mr. Cobb, you just take a second to tell us what the affidavits say that are going to be entered into the record. Uh, both affidavits state that the individuals were among the five affected officers. Both offer... Um, the observation that they do not believe that Mr. Bulger that was the, sp the sponsor um, and offer up the observation that they had nothing to do with Lancaster Street uh, and there were other things going on in law enforcement in Massachusetts that may well have um, contributed to the filing of this particular amendment. Okay. Fair, uh, that's a paraphrase, Mr. Right. I mean, they wouldn't necessarily have known who had put it in, though. Isn't that fair to say? Yes. Do uh, you remember if you voted for the amendment, Mr. Bolger? I don't. <laughs> okay. And were you aware of the specific individuals who would be affected by the amendment? You are now, obviously, but... Uh, oh, no. No. It's a... Uh, no. It was... I think one of hundreds of amendments at the budget time. All right. And I didn't know. That. I never knew of it until long afterwards. All right. I think this would be a good time for the committee to break. We have a, a 10 minutes uh, left on a vote on the floor. Uh, we'll probably reconvene in about 15 Mr. minutes. Chairman, uh, yes. Before we leave, could I ask one real quick question? Uh, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that you don't recall uh, talking to Connolly or anybody about the Lancaster Street investigation. Is that what you said? I don't believe I ever spoke to John Connolly about Lancaster Street. Never. Did you talk to anybody about that investigation? I don't think so. I know, but the point is you're saying, I don't think so. And, and, and you know, we, we've had a lot of people testify before the committee who had what I call convenient memory loss. And what I want to know is can you categorically say you did not talk to anybody about that investigation? Can you categorically say you did not talk to anybody about that? Mr. Mr. Congressman, could I just ask when this uh, Lancaster Street event uh, occurred? I just don't have even... 1982. I, 1982. Well, my preference is to say I, that uh, categorically I cannot recall ever talking with anyone, but I think it's hazardous over 20 years, something that seems to have appeared in the newspaper from time to time, to suggest that um, that's absolutely so. 
Well, it, it, the reason I asked the question sure. is pretty significant because only five people were affected. They were people that were causing your brother some heartburn. You were the president of the Senate, and now you're saying you can't remember. That would be pretty significant if you were trying to uh, punish these people who were after your brother. So I just Mr. want to ask one more. You, you, you say you can't remember. I, never, I have never sought to punish anyone who was uh, in law enforcement and was uh, in pursuit of my but brother. You, but you can't categorically say that you didn't talk to anybody about that? During these 20 years? No, during the time the amendment was going to be pending and it was going to be passed. Oh, I don't believe so, no. You don't believe so? Categorically, can you say you didn't? At that time, there were, again, may I just explain my, the reason for my caution with my answer, it's this. There was some kind of a uh, struggle between the uniformed uh, police and the, and this is, I think, is the basis for the amendment, and the people who are in this category of uh, officers who uh, had, well, officer status. And the uniformed people were, uh, thought it was against their interest that people would be frozen into their jobs after having uh, become the officers, because then they themselves could no longer aspire to those officers. I don't recall any conversations with any of the uh, state police at that time, but it could very well be that some one or some of them may have talked to me, and I thought that the amendment uh, had a different purpose. And then I don't remember it. I just don't remember it. It was of no great, it was no great significance to me. And I'm confident people who are in the legislature, they mu you must know that uh, amendments and measures that are coming before you by the hundreds or dozens uh, are things that um, is, is the tendency is to forget what exactly. But if, if well, I know we have to go, but okay. this affected people that were after your brother, oh, but it, and you don't remember these people I being it, it, penalized. The, the amendment never, uh, I never asked anyone to do any such thing as put that I know you said in. that, but you don't remember. He, he don't said that I categorically, know. that you never I, asked, right? Oh, and, never, no. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Burton, you'll get, uh, we'll recognize you when we come uh, Thank back. You, uh, Mr. Burton, we'll get a break for probably close Thank to you. half an hour. Thank you. Committee will come back to order. We have people take their seats. Uh, it's our time, but the gentleman from Massachusetts, we're, we're trying to just get some continuity. Gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Meehan, you have a follow-up question. I just wanted to uh, to ask uh, Mr. Bulger on the uh, on this amendment. My, my understanding was it wasn't an amendment, but rather it was an outside section of the uh, budget, and it was actually in the Senate Ways and Means proposal, which presumably uh, would mean that. It was approved by the leadership in the Senate. In other words, this wasn't just an amendment that was offered in the floor of the Senate, I don't think. It could very well be the case. Okay, my point is that, that if an outside section is proposed and included in the Senate Ways and Means budget, it, it probably has the, it, it's not like it was just some amendment with there are hundreds of amendments that are filed during the budget process. This was actually mm -hmm. in the way Senate Ways and Means budget proposal that was presented to the, uh, to the Senate. At least I, that was my understanding. It could very well be the case, uh, Congressman. I just, I, I just. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And we can do subsequent research, see if there's any other. Uh, okay, gentleman from Indiana is recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The bottom line is you just don't remember. That's right. Just don't remember. Five people that were after your brother, they were penalized financially. When you were the President of the Senate, you had nothing to do with it and you don't remember. Well, the, prem the premise is not true that uh, such people were uh, penalized. Well, there's, uh, what, 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 what did the amendment do? The amendment never, it, it only becomes effective when it's uh, signed by the governor. But you, well, what did the amendment do? It was a, I'm, uns uh, I'm uncertain of that. To it say it freezes, wasn't it freezes. Huh? To say it wasn't penalizing them, then you must know what it did. You, didn't no, you, no, didn't, but it you, never became law, uh, Congressman. No, but you just said it didn't penalize them. Yeah, I now, see, yes, because it never became law, unless something becomes... There are proposals. We have about 5,000 uh, proposals a year at the legislative level. They well, only, the they only, the they only achieve their purpose, whatever it might be, I, I know, when but they the thing, passed into law. The thing that's very interesting is you said you didn't remember anything about it, but now you're saying it didn't become law. How do you recall that? I don't that? think it's in, I don't think it's not inconsistent. Well, tell me why it's not inconsistent. Well, if you can tell me that, that you, 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 you said no, you I'm didn't trying to tell you that you said you didn't remember the amendment. It doesn't. If it doesn't become law, it doesn't achieve its purpose, no, whatever the purpose might be. No, I understand. I if understand. it's to I'm save money, for let us just say we have an amendment or a, a measure which would you're thinking, which would uh, I'm you're, thinking. You're thinking. The, 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 I'm a legislator too. You said you didn't recall the amendment. You, did, you had thousands of amendments going of on, and you were the leader of the Senate. But you just said then, well, it didn't become law. How do you know that if you don't remember? Be, because subsequent to that, it's been written about. Oh, I see. You picked it up from the newspapers. Did you check to see if it became law when you read it in the newspapers? I don't believe so. By the way, well, I'm then, also relying then, then how do you know it didn't become I, law? May I just uh, acquaint you with what Mr. Agnes uh, says of it? And he is one of those people who is affected. If, if you give me a chance, I'd like to just well, give you his affidavit. About, I'm only concerned about the amendment. Whether yes, and he's recall. speaking to the amendment. And Mr. Agnes is a, uh, he's a retired lieutenant colonel in the Massachusetts State Police. Uh, he I, says, I, I, I'm one of five former senior officers who would have been adversely affected. Mr. Bulger, affected. I simply don't have the time for you to read that into the record. I'd like it's to in, answer It's that. in the record. We, we've we've you, submitted you can submit it. It would be record. enlightening, I think, if well, folks who are hearing... I would, rather, I would rather your answers be as concise as possible. Gentleman controls the time, sir. Did you, you, you grew up with John Connolly, didn't you? I did. And you and your bro brothers were, were buddies of John Connolly throughout your childhood and into adulthood. I didn't know that. That's well, news. Well, were you or weren't you? No. I mean, I, I know when I went into the Army... In the year when I was 19 years of age, John Connolly was 12 years of age. Oh, I see. Man. So it's highly unlikely, in the course of normal relationships. That so he was very close to, to Whitey, though. He was closer to Whitey. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Well, how did he and Whitey get to know each other? I think it all came years later. But they came from the same neighborhood. Yes. Uh. Did uh, Mr. Connolly assist you in any of your political endeavors? I believe so. In what endeavors did he help you? When I'd be uh, involved in campaigns in the, in the district. Did he help you in your campaign to become uh, president of the Senate? Well, that was an in, no, that was within the body, and he did not. Well, one of your opponents was indicted, wasn't he, and convicted? No. You didn't have an opponent that was uh, that was a potential opponent that was going to the you know. incumbent. It was in, it, yeah. The majority leader was indicted, and that paved the way for upward mobility. Well, that was one of your potential opponents. Wasn't he indicted about that time? I don't think of he. He was. He, he is still, I hope, a friend of mine, and uh, he was indicted. Yes. And that paved the way for you to become the president of the Senate. I, it was still within the power of the president to decide who would be named uh, majority leader. So there was nothing definite about my 
uh, ascendancy into that position. Do, do, you, do you know of any threats made by your brother Whitey to people that uh, were giving you political difficulty, creating difficulty for you? I don't know. I, I don't know, but nothing authorized by me, I assure you, Congressman. But, but nothing. Th th there are people who said that Whitey came up to him and said, hey, you know who I am, you SOB. If you don't leave my brother alone, you're going to re regret it. You don't know anything about that? I don't know much about it, no. Do you know who the people were that were threatened? No. They, they, you had no... You, you had no uh, connection or, or, or oh, I, I assure you, I would never, never, you know, ask for or authorize such a, a madcap kind of conduct on his part or on anyone's part. Other than the, uh, the uh, property we talked about a while ago, uh, did, you ever, uh, did you ever use any of your authority to, uh, to chastise or threaten people that... Uh, that were after your brother? No, never. Never did? Did you talk to your brother about rumors that he was an informant? I don't recall such a conversation, but... Um, I, I would assume that someplace after it appeared in the newspaper, I might have asked the question, what is this all about? I know his answer would, again, and I'm speculating, but his answer would be very swiftly, oh, that's, that's just not true. Did you talk to Conley about whether or not your brother was a government informant? No, I don't believe so. No, I... Can you I don't can, well, I have to say I don't believe so, Congressman, well, I know, but, because but these I, things are 15 I, this, years... That's pretty significant. You cannot categorically say you didn't talk to Conley? No. About your, What's that? No, I cannot categorically say that so I did you, not. So you talk. you might have talked to Conley about it. Of course. Okay. In retrospect, given your power and prestige, did you ever discourage law enforcement from doing everything it could to go after your brother? Never. Never. You referred to your brother as Reverend and a St. Patrick's Day function. I just as a side, I'd like to know why you did that. I would like to know myself. I don't ever have, I don't believe I ever did. But I can assure you those things are on tapes all over the place and we could find out. I never, in my uh, experience, used that expression to describe okay. my brother, ever. Uh, you had a, a longtime aide, Mr. Joyce, uh, and I, I believe he was working where? At the convention center? Right. Now, he, he hired uh, uh, people like uh, Theresa Stanley who was one of the people that fled with your brother uh, when she came back. Did you have anything to do with that? No. Uh, I'm reminded by counsel that uh, it may turn out that uh, he, Mr. Joyce, never did hire Teresa Stanley. He did not hire her? Uh, that's, that's what I believe has been... Uh, um, but well, then we have an error in the information we have. We'll check that out. But you say she, she was not hired by him. Right. Was anybody else hired by him that, well, uh, many had, that had a connection with you or, and your brother? Um, I don't know. I'm sure there were people in South Boston who... My problem with the question, if, you, if I may, is that um, if I recommended someone, and it was rare that I did, because when Joyce got the job, I said, please just do the very best job and you won't be imposed upon yeah. by me. And well, the if, question I, if, is I, if I recommended someone, uh, Congressman, it might very well be that he's known or she is known by both of us. Okay. But it's not because of it. Did you uh, have anything to do with the efforts to get the Billy Johnson police report? I think you answered that in some to some degree earlier. I, I would... Did you have any, uh, 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 were you involved in the efforts to get the Billy Johnson police report? No. About the money at the airport? Never. It was just, it's, 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 um, 
It comes from the tabloid talk show stuff in Boston, and it was concocted there. And there's not even an accusation that um, I can fight on that. It's, uh, and when Mr. David Davis, who's the one named by them as having been asked by me, his affidavit says, at no time did William Bulger or any person purporting to act on his behalf intercede with me to affect our handling of the incident or how we dealt with information about it. I never provided copies of reports written by Trooper Johnson to Senate President Bulger. No one at Mass Port Authority ever indicated to me they were contacted in those matters by William Bulger. Okay. Whenever I have been asked, this is, I think, important well, to no, know. Well, I think you've made the point. You don't need to read no, it all. No, but there's a, there's a larger point to be made, Congressman. May I respectfully just make it in one sentence? All right. Whenever I have been asked about what I have described as the incident, which did occur, or William Bulger interceding in any way in connection with it, or Trooper Johnson, which did not occur, I have attempted to make clear that the former Senate President did not, to my knowledge, involve himself. <laughs> Nevertheless, the insinuation that he did persists in some circles. The insinuation is false. Um, you, you indicated in your opening statement that you were, you knew your brother was involved in some nefarious activities, but you didn't know you know, a great deal about it. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Did you know that he was involved in murder? No, no, I do not. I did, did you not. know he was involved in narcotics trafficking? No. You, you, you and your brother, you didn't know anything about that. Did you know anything about the Winter Hill mob? The, the what? The, the gang that he was connected to. No, I didn't. You I didn't? don't think I met anybody from that. You didn't know Fleming? I did know Steve Fleming, yes. Well, he was part of that gang. You didn't know he was part of that gang? No. Or his brother? I don't, didn't know his brother. Do you know uh, a gentleman named uh, Maritano? No. Oh, no, I don't. I've read of him. Let me see what Mr. Maritano said here. Mr. Maritano, who was a hitman for the Mafia, testified at Connolly's federal racketeering trial that Connolly protected James at your urging. Did you ask Connolly to protect James, saying something like, just keep my brother out of trouble? Whatever was done by uh, Connolly would not have been done at my urging. And I, I know there was no urging on my part along those lines. There was something about the quote itself which uh, seemed uh, to, be, uh, to be kind of innocent, again, depending on the circumstances. And if I ever said such a thing, it would mean that I, I'm saying, uh, please, um, you know, steer him clear of uh, getting into trouble or mm. keeping his nose clean or following the straight and narrow, did, the did, kind of thing we might be inclined to did, say. Did, did, did you ever ask any law enforcement officer, state, local, federal, Mr. Conley, anybody to assist your brother in any way? Never. None? I don't believe ever in my life, never. Well, I, don't, I don't want you to say I don't well, I, believe. Well, well, you, I have to say that because, you know, I've lived, uh, I've got, you know, some mileage on me, so who knows. But I don't believe there's anything anywhere that uh, was done nefariously or any kind of request okay. for anyone not okay. to do his duty. Did, did, ever. You, did you ever express gratitude for law enforcement efforts to keep your brother out of jail? No. Never did? No, I don't believe so ever. I have to say I don't believe so because it, uh, who knows what you might uh, uh, have said in jest or whatever. And you know that, Mr. Congressman, you know that that's uh, the only way. I assure you, no one has been, I have never expressed gratitude some, to anyone on any serious note uh, for their having failed to do their job, ever. Well, you're a very good attorney and you qualify your statements very well. Thank We're, you. We uh, gentleman's time's expired. If he would ask for an additional 10 minutes by unanimous consent, I, I, think I my I, colleagues may have some questions, so why don't I uh, think we'd be willing to do that and then break, as I understand it. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, yes. 
Our side has 30 minutes to inquire of this witness. Uh, many of us have conflicts. I have another committee going on. Right. And I, I wondered if we could start off uh, with five minutes on our side. Why don't we do that? Is that? That's fine, gentlemen. We, you yes, have, I, you'll I, have your time. I think these colleagues of ours need, uh, deserve the same amount of time, so that's fine with me. All right, we, uh, we will flip it to your side. Uh, Mr. That's fine. Uh, Mr. Waxman for five minutes. Mr. Bulger, you, you've just stated unequivocally that you've never used your office, uh, you've never intervened in any way to uh, aid your brother in any of his activities or to aid him in uh, avoiding arrest. Is that your testimony? That, that is my testimony, yes, sir. And um, then it comes down really to a question about a conversation you've had with your brother. And I want to ask you about that last contact with your brother. Um, you testified you spoke with him by telephone in right. January 1995. Is that the only contact you've had with him? That was, that was the contact. For, uh, for how, lo how long a period of time? Since he, he fled? Yes, okay. since he fled. What was the substance of your conversation? It was, um, it was a conversation of about three or four minutes duration, Congressman. It was he calling me. And he, um, it's at the very, like the first four or five weeks after his indictment. And I never thought that we'd still be, that, that, that there would not have been a resolution of it ordinarily in these cases. So the tone of it was um, something like this. He told me that uh, don't believe everything that's being said about me. It's uh, not true. I think he was trying to give me some comfort on that level. And, um, and he, I don't know, he, um, he, I think he asked me to tell everybody he's okay. And, uh, and then I told him, well, you know, we care very much for you. And um, we're very hopeful. I think I said, I hope this will have a happy ending. Did At he that ask time, you? there was no talk of the more terrible uh, crimes. Did he ask you to do anything other than to tell people he was okay? No. And did you ask that he do anything? No. Did you provide him with any uh, advice, such as advice to surrender to the authorities? No, the subject, I've, I've said this before in my grand jury, Congressman, that that subject never came up. Okay. It's been alleged that you and your brother made arrangements for the call to evade surveillance of your telephones by law enforcement authorities. Where were you when you received the telephone call from uh, James Bulger in 19? I was in a friend in an employee's home. And I was asked the question before, uh, you know, uh, did you have a desire to avoid electronic surveillance in connection with that call? And I answered no. I was asked where I would be, and I received the call there. Who asked you where you would be? I, I, do not have, I don't have a specific recollection, but the only person it possibly could have been would be his friend, Kevin Weeks. Mm -hmm. um, you've been criticized for not contacting law enforcement officials about your call with your brother. Did you contact the authorities before or after receiving the call? No, I told my lawyer immediately after it. In Massachusetts, we have the benefit of a statute which allows for a sibling to uh, talk to uh, a brother or sister under these circumstances. And uh, I thought that that, well, I think now that that's somewhat protective. There was a law that said Is it this you're special permitted? Chapter 274, Section 4, I think. Uh -huh. And uh, it's a one that... Um, is uh, protective of the family relationship. It seeks to encourage the family relationship and be protective of it. Many and, people uh, have written about your actions and they've said you had a basic choice. You had to choose between loyalty to your brother and your civic duty to assist in his arrest, and you chose your uh, brother. How do you respond to that criticism? Well, well they're, they're wrong on that. 
I I'm his brother. He called me. He or he sought to call me. And I told his friend where I'd be, and I received the call. And it seems to me that um, it, it, that is in no way inconsistent with my devotion to my own uh, responsibilities, my public responsibilities as a, uh, well, at that time, uh, President of the Senate. I believe that I uh, have always taken those as the, my first um, my first uh, obligation. One the, uh, uh, gentleman's five minutes of you, uh, if, we, if, if you, I might just ask for one certainly. clarification for the record. The one of my time. colleagues uh, made the statement that you requested immunity before testifying, imp implying that you were, in essence, fishing for an immunity deal. W w was that the circumstance? No, it was not. I, uh, the immunity um, request came on a couple of bases. Um, um, I, this is the immunity I sought um, recently in December. And it, when, it, it, that then, then uh, Mr. Chairman, I mean, Mr. Uh, Congressman. Yes. The, um, at that time, my uh, grand jury notes minutes had been uh, leaked to the Boston uh, Globe. I felt as though I was going to be involved in a huge memory test about what had been my testimony a couple of years before at the grand jury. And I would like to have seen my grand jury minutes, but they were denied to me. The judge had no problem, apparently, with the fact that the, the Globe had my grand jury minutes, but he nevertheless denied them to me. And uh, so it made me uh, concerned about about it. And I, you know, I the business of, of when you're going into a grand jury. I mean, others have written about this, but uh, innocent people are more likely to plead the privilege in secret proceedings. In a secret proceeding, you're all alone, and the prosecutor knows, and the prosecutors, in this case, plural, know what they're doing. And uh, it's a time, I think, for great caution. And it's a, an exercise, in my belief, of a constitutional right that uh, is for the innocent. And uh, so I exercised it. And I thought that there should be no punishment for it. And no one should question it as uh, it being something bad. That's my understanding, as, understanding of it as an attorney. And in fact, the law, the cases in the Supreme Court of the United States insist that it's a law for innocent men who find themselves in ambiguous circumstances. And it should not be a uh, method of uh, punishment or persecution on, for anyone who exercises that right. May I try one more moment on this, since you well, seem to be you, patient? Before you get into um, some of the details on the privilege, y y you took the privilege before this committee previously, right. this committee has granted you immunity, right. which means we can compel you to uh, testify right. because you will not be incriminating yourself since you've been granted immunity. Did that grant of immunity come at your, your, your request to the committee? The, gr the grant of immunity? Yes. Well, the committee uh, did what I would have expected. It would grant the immunity <laughs> once I, I uh, was declined to uh, to testify, but I guess it's not at my request so much as at the uh, request of the committee of the Justice Department. Is that? It was an offer by the committee. I see. Yeah. That's right. Well, that clarifies it for the record, uh, because I think there was a, a, an impression that uh, was not a, a, a fully thought out one, and yeah. I appreciate your elaborating on it. I, to say, I appreciate the gentleman clarifying that it came from this. This was the committee's reaction to his being. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm compelled to uh, go to another committee. Uh, Mr. Tierney is going to uh, manage the time on our side, and uh, I appreciate the courtesy uh, you and he has, have extended to me. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you. This is a difficult format, uh, and I, it's perfect for you, uh, Mr. Bulger, probably as much as for the committee members here who have a limited time. Uh, I'm going to do five minutes or so here and then ask Mr. Lynch followed by uh, Mr. Meehan and uh, Mr. Delahunt to do the same, and then we'll collectively deal with whatever time we have left. 
Um, well, the gentleman yield, weren't, weren't uh, other members expecting a break at this point? They were, but I, I think the chairman is. Uh, I, I, I think at this point we're going to let Mr. If we recognize people in five minute intervals, we can move through a little quicker because we have a vote expected at one. I see. Well, I, I, uh, I understood there was going to be a break, and I asked just I have my opportunity now, so others might have been expecting a break. That's what changed things, eh? What's that? That's what changed things. Well, I, I would uh, urge you to think through whether members have been relying on the expectation of a break and that I interceded to. Um, um, to change the, uh, but the, whatever you two decide. We'll take some time and then we'll, uh, we'll assess that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bulger, at the close of your opening remarks, uh, you made the statement that uh, you, th you think that the fairer perspective will surface again for those other family members who have shown great strength in the face of the onslaught by the media and by overzealous government authority. What were you referring to in the overzealous government authority part of that? Well, there's been a, um, uh, a deep inquiry from uh, various uh, people. I, I'm not sure, for example, um, I don't mean, I'm, I'm not thinking even of the government in Boston when it released my grand jury minutes to the uh, press and refused to give them to me. You believe the government did that? Well, the government had control of it. I think it bears responsibility in some way for it. So that was it? That, no, well, there are other things. I, uh, as recently as a week ago, uh, we received a visit at my home from um, two people who identified themselves as FBI people. And uh, they um, met my daughter. And uh, I asked her to just give me a quick synopsis of it. May I just read it to you? Well, I, I think at the end of our time, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do that. But if okay. you want to enter the written synopsis on the record, we could ask the chairman to do that with unanimous oh, consent. Okay. And I've got some other questions I want to okay. but they, go may into. I just okay. May I just quote one of the uh, we'll paragraphs? Sure. Go ahead. We'll extend some time. One of the gentlemen said, look, I'm from Boston. We want to talk to your mother. She doesn't have to say a word. We just want her to listen to us. We want to explain things to her. Do you see what's going on in North Carolina with Rudolph? They are tearing that town apart. That's what will happen here. But if we can get someone in the family, just one person to drop, say something that will help us arrest the fugitive, it will be over just like that. We will even help to rebuild your father's reputation. Do you have the names of those two individuals? Yes. Okay, and you'll share those with the committee? Sure. Would you say state them right now? Why? Why? Yeah. One's name is James Stover, and the other is J. J. Michael Doyle. Thank you. Thank you. And we ask that that uh, document be submitted on the record by unanimous yeah. consent. Yeah, without objection, so we're going to resume the time. Mr. Bulger, uh, you know that this committee is investigating the conduct of the FBI, and, and uh, I want to go into one particular agent at the moment, and that would be Mr. Connolly on that. Did you encourage Mr. Connolly to attend Boston College? I, I may have. I, I honestly don't recall. I would. Um, I was a little older, of course, and Connolly would be um, around, and uh, I, I, I could very well have. Did you write a letter of recommendation for him to, gra to attend graduate school? I don't, I don't believe so. Oh, about the Kennedy School of Government, I'm reminded is, uh, I think I did send a letter over to the Kennedy School. Okay. And did you know whether or not he had a relationship with your brother James? At some point I became aware of it. And uh, when was that? It was, um, well, I'm uncertain there too, but sometime in the 80s. Okay. Now, Mr. Connolly worked on some of your campaigns you testified earlier. I, I believe he, he probably did. And do you recall meeting with him or being in his company uh, at your own office once you got elected? Oh, yes, yeah. Okay. And there's a, a fact that he used to bring in new, mem new FBI agents and bring them over to your office to introduce He'd bring, them? He'd bring people through. And in that vein, did he ever introduce you to John Morris? Yeah, I don't recall any meeting with John Morris, but I'm told that he's among those who came through. And after Mr. Connolly left the FBI, did you in any way assist in his procurement of employment in the private sector? No, I did not, uh, Congressman. Um, 
I could also tell you that I have uh, uh, an affidavit from the hiring authority. Will we ask that that be submitted on the record also? Without yes. objection. Did mm -hmm. you write any recommendations for him? Pardon me? Did you write any recommendations for him? Did you go to the Edison Company? Yes. yes. Oh, no, no, I, I did and not. And allow your name to be used as a reference? No, I didn't, uh, I don't. I, no, I, think I think it's against the law, by the way, in Massachusetts for somebody, for us to intervene on the matter of, you know, as legislators, on the matter of uh, employment at a utility. After Mr. Connolly left the FBI, it's a fact, isn't it, that he used to attend some of your political events? More than likely, yes. Okay. And at those events, isn't it also a fact that you used to ask him, as a, a courtesy to you, to take uh, certain individuals around the room and introduce them to various people that were there? No, I don't remember that. Okay. Now, Special Agent uh, James Ring of the FBI, whom, whom you, I believe you know, James Ring. I think I know who he is, okay. yeah. Uh, he testified that in 1983 you walked into the home of Stephen Flemmy's mother mm -hmm. while James Bulger, John Connolly, Mr. Ring, and Stephen Flemmy were there. Do you recall that event? I do not. Uh, do you recall ever seeing Mr. Connolly and your brother James uh, in the same company? I don't believe I ever saw them together, ever. Did you ever remember uh, Mr. Connolly telling you that, that he had had conversations with your brother James or was in his company from time to time? I don't think he, he told me. I don't think uh, he ever told me. Okay. And it's, on September 20, 1988, the Boston Globe article suggested that your brother James had a relationship with the law enforcement. Was that the first awareness you had of that circumstance? 1988? Right. That was the first time I had heard that term. And by the way, the word informant had a different meaning then than it has now for me. I didn't know whether it meant that someone had on one occasion informed or whether there is a, now I see it as some kind of a special status or whatever. But it was not the way I saw the word, the meaning of the word at that time. How did you see the meaning at that time? No, I didn't, I didn't know what to, to make of it. I didn't know whether, and, uh, but I, I was very certain that um, at that time, and I did, again, it was my feeling that the purpose of, of characterizing my brother as an informant uh, was to uh, put him in uh, grave danger. Mr. Bulger, what is it that you thought your brother did for a living in those years? Oh, well, I knew that he was, uh, for the most part, I had the feeling that he was in the business of uh, gaming and, and uh, whatever was vague to me, but I didn't think of uh, it. Uh, for a long while, he did have some jobs, but uh, ultimately, uh, it was clear that he was not um, being, um, uh, you know, he, he wasn't doing what I like him to do. In your book, uh, While the Music Lasts, in Chapter 9, Mr. Bulger, you write, in the well-publicized case against my brother, all of the evidence has been purchased Inducements more precious than money, release from prison, the waiver of criminal charges have been offered time and time again. Some of those who insisted they had nothing to offer at the beginning of their incarceration have had second thoughts and suddenly remembered things they could barter for advantages. Without such purchase testimony, there would be no accusations. Do you still believe that to be the case? Um, no, I, I have a, a different understanding of it now. I wrote that, I think, in 1995. It was published in 96, and uh, so, so much has gone on since then, I have a different understanding. Okay. But I think at that time, it's a, I, I, it was a fair description of what it, it appeared to me to be. Uh, let me go back just to, to 1985. Um, we've all heard allegations that uh, you accepted $240,000 from a trust fund. Right. Uh, and apparently your law associate, Mr. Finity, is it? Right. Had deposited some $500,000 into that trust fund, and, right. and that's the fund from which you withdrew $240,000. What was the, uh, the nature of that uh, withdrawal? Was it, um, well, what was the payment for? Yeah. First, why did I, why did I say I, I don't want the money from that source? No, I guess starting at the beginning, why did you take the $240,000? What was it oh, for? Oh, I'm sorry. Because, because in, Finity and I were law associates, and Finity's office, while I had left my partnership with him, was the base, the base for my uh, practicing law, and there was a fee that, was, that exceeded $250,000 that was due me, 
and it was coming and it was late. Infinity was uh, being accommodating to me by providing some money in advance. When did you disassociate from that law firm in terms I, of practicing well, regularly? No, I think after, um, well, I became president in 1978 and I realized that it was, I was a burden myself because of the, uh, you know, the, the conflicts and the rest. So that someplace in the middle, I don't know whether it's, at the, it, it's in the 80s. Okay. And I'm uncertain about when. What was the nature of the case for which the fee was owed? That I was working on it was called the Quirk case, and it was about property, and uh, the Quirk brothers, uh, uh, Bruce and Robert, were people who had uh, a dispute with National Semiconductor about property. And uh, I went to uh, court for them on many occasions. And ultimately, it boiled down to a settlement. And uh, the, uh, the quirks publicly um, praised the work I had done for them. They were pleased by the settlement. And the other side, I don't know which one of them, it could have been Halendor, I think might be the other side, was and they, they um, had said for the record that I had handled the case and had been the, he used the term, the heavy on the case. I had a couple. What was the uh, total of the recovery in that case? It was, um, I don't recall, but it could have been something like $350,000 or something like that. That's what your client recovered? That's, that, no, that's what, that was our fee. Okay. Is it about right? Uh, $350,000 was my fee. And you were owed $240,000 of that? Pardon me? And you were owed $240,000 of that total fee? I was owed? Well, you withdrew $240,000 Oh, no, the, the $240,000 was, I, I'd call that some kind of a loan or an advance, and I gave it back to Tom. When you, do you remember when you took the $240,000? Well, he put it into my account, and it was, I don't know what year any longer. But it was, by the way, Congressman, it, was, it turns out that because of the case, Finity had brought an action against Harold Brown. I never worried about too much the fact that Finity, because it was his money to give as he, you know, and I just, so there's, there was nothing sinister about it, I assure you. Well, we're giving you an opportunity to delay that out yeah. now. All right, so but can I, can I just... Um, our friend uh, Harold Brown. Uh, we're going we're okay. to get to that, but and we have allow a, that on the record. Yeah. Uh, that. Uh, but what I'd like to know is when you uh, had that $240,000 deposited in your account, did you spend any of that money? Um, I think I took some and invested it, some of it, yeah, a little bit. And it, at some point in time, did you become aware that Mr. Brown had uh, alleged that Mr. Finity had uh, uh, extorted $500,000 from him? No, we, no. Not, not during that period. It, Finity brought suit, and that was part of someone's defense, but Brown exonerates Finity now. And at some time, you, um, you put the $240,000 back or gave it back? I gave it back because I knew that Brown was the, uh, the source of it. And why did that bother you so and much? Well, because Brown back? was, uh, I didn't know Harold Brown, but he was in some kind of trouble, and I'm elected and it gave opportunity to anyone who would like to misconstrue it to claim that there was some nefarious um, relationship between him and me. Did you ever talk to John Connolly about that situation? I don't believe I ever did. Did you ever talk to John Morris about that situation? I don't, I'm, I, I've, I don't even remember John Morris. Did you ever discuss it with your brother James or any of his associates? I don't think so. Did you ever discuss it with anyone associated with law enforcement? before the investigation started? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Mr. O'Sullivan, Jeremiah O'Sullivan, indicated that he reviewed the case and thought it was a question of power brokering. Do you know what he would have been referring to in that? Yes, I do. And you know, I, O'Sullivan also said that, um, he said there was no, no one who accused me of anything. And he said that it was not a close call. He gave me a very, a good result, the same result I received from the Attorney General in Massachusetts. But when he said that, that was at a press conference, 
Congressman, and it was in response to a Globe reporter. And the Globe reporter was one of those who had this kind of a vested interest in this case. They had, they had brought it, they had discovered it, and they had worked it to death from, um, for several months. And I believe that Jerry, uh, Jeremiah O'Sullivan, who I didn't know, but Jeremiah O'Sullivan, he, I think he strayed from his mandate. That's what it is. He's, when asked the question, you know, what about, he really should have stayed with what he found. But he was giving an opinion that it may be a power brokering a situation. I don't think it was myself, but nevertheless, it gave the uh, Globe people who have always insisted, despite, um, he says, you know, Bulger had any involvement. He says he had none. The simple fact is right. that uh, this did not stop the media snowball. That's what right. Harold Thank Brown uh, complains about. My that. time has expired, Mr. Okay. Bulger. Thank, Thank you, you for your responses. Mr. Lynch. Yeah. You, we'll make sure everybody gets questions. You, we'll, we'll yield as much time as you use, and then we'll go back and forth after the time is up. We said you're set for five, but if you need more, uh, we'll take uh, thank it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, let's, let's pick up right there with uh, Jeremiah O'Sullivan. Uh, in his testim testimony before this committee uh, not long ago, he described the relationship or the dynamic in dealing with the FBI, who, through various agents, have been charged with a lot of wrongdoing in this matter. Uh, at one point, he said words to the effect that you don't mess with the FBI, you just you just cooperate, they can make life miserable right. for you. Right. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at the action of the FBI with respect to your office, uh, the Senate presidency. And, and it probably goes back to when you were, before you were Senate president, when you were in the Senate. But uh, there are a number of individuals here I'd like to ask you about and about your relationships with them. They are all special agents of the FBI and sure. our supervisors. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, Dennis Condon. Uh, he's a special agent of the, of the FBI, and uh, he had some role early on with uh, handling your brother James uh, and his relationship with, with the FBI. Uh, what was his relationship with you, sir? Dennis uh, Condon became very friendly with me. I don't think I knew him before he left, before he retired from the FBI. I don't think I did. Okay, when do, you, when do you think you may have first become an acquaintance of Dennis Condon? My, I think it was when he became uh, head of the um, public safety. He was appointed by uh, Governor Dukakis. And uh, I came to know him there, again, because both of our duties were interrelated. You know. I see. Let me ask you then, Dennis Condon, working for the FBI, comes out of the FBI after handling uh, matters with your, your brother as an informant, and then becomes, uh, I think, Secretary of Public Safety for the Commonwealth? I think that's what it is. Yeah. I'm not certain of that. Did he ever, did he ever is approach that what it you? Is? I don't know. Is that what the public safety? Yes. General? For the record, Mr. Lynch, he was the commissioner of the state police. Commissioner, okay. All right, I stand corrected. He was the commissioner of public safety? State police. State, state police. Hmm? So he came out. Do you recall at all then that uh, uh, did Dennis Condon ever come to you at that point where he was, he was coming out of the FBI after handling your brother's case, or your brother's uh, relationship, and then trying to get this position with the state police, apparently, the commissioner, uh, did he ever come to you and, and use the fact of his relationship never. there no, uh, I never to try to get you to refer yeah. him for that position? He never, I never was aware that he had anything to do with, uh, that he had any relationship at all with my brother. Okay. And he never approached you for help in getting appointed as commissioner? I don't recall it, but he could very well have. I mean, we had many people who were friends in common. He came from uh, Charlestown, I think. Now, you were Senate president at this time. Would, well, would that be correct? Or and the Dukakis, well, the beginning of the Dukakis. There were 12 years of Michael Dukakis's, and I think that he, in the first one, uh, first term in the 70s, I was not the president of the Senate. 
But I think that Dennis came along later while I was president. Is that true? I don't know. I don't know the answer to when. All right. We, we, yeah. But you feel certain it was during the Dukakis administration? I'm pretty sure. Okay. Is it? But you don't recall him ever coming to you and asking you for your help for, for, that, for that appointment? Is that your No, but there'd be no recollection. I don't recall it. But I mean, if he asked, I'd probably be favorably disposed to him. Not based on any of the uh, inferences that I draw from your question, I assure you. Mm. Let me go on to another uh, agent of the FBI, uh, Nick Gianturco. Do you, do you have any knowledge or do you have any acquaintance or relationship with Nick Gianturco? I don't believe I, I don't know him, I don't think. Okay. Uh, Nick Gianturco left the FBI similar to Dennis Conant and went to work for the Edison. Uh, do, you, do you recall uh, ever getting a request from Mr. Gianturco I don't think, uh, I don't for a reference? I, I don't believe I ever did. But I, I don't, I don't think so. Let me go back then. Do you do you remember Mr. Gian Turco? I don't think I do. Okay. I know the name Gian Turco, but I don't know the person. Okay. We've already covered uh, in this questioning uh, Special Agent John Connolly, and. Just so we're certain, I, I, I do have on the record an affidavit from uh, Mr. Davis, who right. was first at the Massport right. and then went over as CEO for the Edison. And he Davis. indicates in his, in his uh, affidavit that it is his uh, knowledge and belief that uh, oh. it was others okay. yeah. uh, at the Edison who advocated on behalf of John Conley. Right. It was Carl Gustin, Congressman, not David Davis. Ah, okay. So, and, and it's, Gustin says, I am aware of the rumors repeated in the press that former Senate President William Bolger got Mr. Connolly his job at Edison. The rumors are false. And he points to a gentleman named John Keogh. Is that correct? Yes, he does, yeah. All right. Let me ask you about John Keogh. Amazingly right. enough, John Keogh is also another FBI agent. Right. A former FBI agent that went right. to work for the Edison. Can I ask you about your relationship with John Keogh? Do you have any knowledge of him? Yeah, I do know who John Keogh was. He's a very quiet person. Okay. I don't think I ever had a conversation with John Keogh other than in the early, or in the 70s, around 1974, there were helicopters flying over the community during the turmoil. And uh, I called him and complained about it. I thought angrily. And uh, the only thing, and the reason, somehow I remember him because I thought he was very fair with an elected official who was um, advocating for the community, angrily, that he never uh, made any kind, he never exploited it, never said how tough I was on him or any of that. Okay. Do you recall if John Keel in getting, now he was also involved uh, with this whole matter with the FBI and the Boston office. Right. Uh, went to work, came out of there, went to work for the Edison. Do you ever recall uh, John Keel quietly or otherwise uh, lobbying you or asking for your support in, in getting his job at the, at the Edison? I don't think he ever did. Now, I have no recollection. I didn't even, I don't think I ever knew that John uh, Keogh had gone to the Edison. Okay. Let's go, go to uh, Special Agent Robert Sheehan of mm -hmm. the FBI. Uh, left the FBI, I believe was involved with, uh, with some of the, uh, the informant operations there at the FBI. Actually, I think preceding mm -hmm. uh, the relationship with with your brother and Mr. Fleming, but also during that. Uh, he left the FBI and retired and went to work at the Heinz Convention Center. Uh, what, what is your relationship? Do you have any knowledge of Mr. Sheehan? I think I came to know Sheehan uh, toward the end of his days. 
I would see him at a certain restaurant, and he had he was uh, hooked up with a um, a breathing apparatus. What time? I, what what time period? Do you have a recollection? I don't remember of that exactly, but it was uh, he died shortly thereafter. But he, she, and um, would have been friendly with the head of the convention center, Fran Joyce. So I don't know that I ever was asked even to uh, use my... Let me just ask the question to get it on the record. Uh, do you recall at all that uh, uh, Mr. Sheehan uh, came to you or, or requested... Uh, now, given the backdrop here that your brother's in this relationship, and at some point you were aware uh, from your earlier testimony uh, from things that were in the paper, I think Mr. H. Paul Rico had had uh, let slip the fact that your, your brother had a relationship, ongoing relationship with the FBI. Uh, do you have any recollection that uh, Mr. Sheehan might have capitalized on that fact to try to get you to help him in getting a job at uh, the Heinz Convention Center? I don't think he did. I don't think he did. But you know, if you don't mind my just mentioning that uh, the State House is in our senatorial district. True. People came through that office by the hundreds, and I would make use my vast intercessory power for folks if I thought it was all right. And I would always say to the person on the other end, if this is not um, something you should not do, just don't. And I was always careful of it. There's probably and nobody on this panel but, but more I don't, familiar. But I, really, I just don't remember uh, t uh, uh, Sheehan coming through with, uh, t looking for help. I don't remember that. I have to say that. I just, um, and I knew him, and I used to see him and his wife at uh, a little restaurant they frequented, and, and I'd go over and chat with him, but it was in the last year or so of his life. It's, it's just a, what I'm getting at is yeah. not the, the fact of your responsibility in trying to help constituents. Right. That is quite normal in the right. course of your your duties. What I'm getting at is is Dennis Condon, Nick Gianturco, John Conley, John Keogh, Robert Keehan, uh, Robert Sheehan, and, and and others who leave the FBI right. and then uh, perhaps try to exercise the leverage of their relationship with your brother. Sure. To get you to help them. I don't and, think and so okay. I'm looking at the wrongdoing, sure. the misconduct of the FBI agents right. in in this case. Right. And and I'm trying to find out whether or not there is a systematic There was never not one, not to interrupt, excuse me, but there was never a case that anybody came ever and said, I knew your brother. I befriended your brother. I therefore uh, ask you to please befriend me. No one ever said that to me, ever. Okay. So those people would go to such jobs. I'm sure they were finding similar births and before I ever arrived. No doubt. Uh, I know I've exhausted my, my five minutes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> and, then, and then some. Mr. Meehan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you. First, I guess I want to clear up the record. Uh, Mr. Bulger said that few, if anyone, has condemned the uh, leaking of grand jury minutes. When, uh, when we had this hearing in Boston, I condemned the leaking of the grand jury minutes at that time, uh, said that uh, violations of uh, the law relative to leaking of grand jury minutes was every bit as serious as the abuses mm -hmm. in law enforcement that we are um, investigating and trying to correct today. Um, and, uh, and I think that they should be investigated. And uh, I think your rights uh, in, that, in that instance uh, were violated and spoke out at the time. Uh, the other point that I wanted to mention was the, um, the outside section of the, of the budget. I just think there's a difference between hundreds of amendments being put in and the Ch Senate Chairman of the Ways and Means presenting a budget that, that has this provision, and I, I just view it differently. And at the time, it was a major issue because uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety, Frank Trabuco, called on Governor King to veto that provision, saying that, uh, the, uh, that if the investigators lost their jobs through reduction in rank or retirement, 
We would lose our entire intelligence gathering management team. It would dismantle the operation of all intelligence gathering in this area would, would, uh, would stop. Um, going back to your relationship, obviously you've had a close relationship with John Conley. Do you recall seeing John Conley when he came back in 1975, uh, when he returned to Boston as an FBI agent? Do, do I recall seeing him? Seeing him, talking to him, when he came back in 1975. I'm sure I must have, but I don't have any distinct, you know, specific recollection. Of well, would, would you... Would you have regular contact with him, for example, no. on the phone? No. Or in person? No. But you have testified that he would bring, you were aware that he was an FBI agent. Right. And he would bring uh, certain people from the FBI uh, by to see you, is that correct? That's what you've testified? Occasionally he did. And. You've, I'm not clear on, did you ever discuss your brother uh, James with Conley? I don't think I ever discussed my brother with uh, John Conley. I don't believe I ever did. And, and when did you during first? During those times, and later times, I did. And, and when did you in first? In the 90s, for example. Okay, so when did you first learn that, that your brother uh, James had an ongoing relationship with, with Conley? I'm uncertain of that. I didn't... Uh, it, come, it, it didn't come in a flash, but just be, it, it became um, known to me as time went on. It so when did you... In the, in the late 80s, I'd say, or the early 90s. Okay. W w when did you first learn that he was informant, apparently, when it was published in the, in the Globe? Right, and I wasn't sure then. Did you ever discuss this relationship uh, with your brother James, with Conley? No. Did you ever discuss this ongoing relationship with, uh, with James? with John Conley? I don't think so. Now, you've indicated that you didn't help uh, John Conley get a job with, uh, with Boston Edison. Uh, were you on the board of New England Power in 1990? No. Um, at any time, were you on the I board? I went onto the board of New England Power um, after I left the uh, Senate and became uh, president of the And University. that was after John Conley had uh, gotten a job oh, yeah, Boston Edison? Long after. Did you, uh, did you serve on the board of directors of South Boston Savings Bank? No. Did you ever assist John Conley in ever securing a, a loan from South Boston Savings Bank? Not that I know of. Did you meet, uh, did John Conley ever bring by a uh, special agent in charge, James Greenleaf? J James who? Uh, Greenleaf. I, I don't, the name doesn't uh, ring a... I don't know. Okay. Um, the issue of the issue of 75 State Street, and my, my recollection was that it was actually investigated by two state attorney generals. Um, right. You can understand why it would be an issue, though, because, uh, and it's unfortunate, but we're looking at the FBI, and uh, we have we, the, there is evidence now to suggest uh, John Morris was Conley's supervisor. He's admitted to taking bribes from uh, Whitey Bulger. At the same time, he apparently was in charge of this investigation. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think past investigations should be brought up. However, it's, it's just a little funny how John Morris is in charge of the, uh, the FBI portion. And, and now we find out that not only was he Conley's supervisor, but he's admitted to taking bribes. It's sort of the reason why one would ask um, questions on mm. it. Otherwise, otherwise, I don't think any members would bring it up. I could, may I just point out that John Morris was, clearly is no fr was no friend of mine. He, he, uh, I, right. I, no, you've made that clear. Um, but he has admitted to taking, I think, five thousand right. dollars from from James uh, from James Balter. And the, I don't think, you know, I, I don't know what his function was, but uh, um, I, I don't I don't think he was pivotal in this whole matter. In the 1995 uh, telephone call that you had with your brother, um, why did you go to the home of uh, an employee to accept the call? I, I have to reconstruct, but I think that um, I think that Kevin Weeks asked me where I'd be, and I think I told him that. 
And you, you knew Kevin Weeks pretty well? Not very well, no. Only through him. Did he mention that, uh, that you would have to use a different uh, phone because it was likely that... Uh, no, he did not. No. He just asked where... Yeah. So, so you didn't go to um, the home of an employee for any reason other than... Um, you, you weren't trying to avoid being, uh, having the phone call... Yeah, I've been asked that question several times, Congressman, and I always said no. I was just doing what I was asked. But I, where, will, where will you be answering the question? Do you know a Richard uh, Schneiderhan? I don't recall him, but I'm, I've been told that I know him, yeah. But, but you don't know him? I don't remember him. He's, I think he came uh, to my office, according to press reports, one time because he was interested in a, a particular edifice, a church, which uh, might qualify and did ultimately qualify for some kind of protection under uh, architectural laws. In 1999, did anyone ever tell you that you should be careful using your phone because of law enforcement investigators? Prior to that, I had been told by my counsel, who had been told by the U.S. Attorney's Office, that my phone and my brother Jack's phones were both, um, they had pen registers on them. Did be, after that, did anyone ever give you any reason to suspect that any investigator was in any way monitoring your phone calls? No, I don't think so. Did uh, anyone... Other than that monitoring, I suppose this is, if, again, the meaning of the word monitoring. I don't think they're listening in, but they're, they were, in fact, uh, hard at the task of calling people who might call me from uh, strange places like Connecticut or uh, places like... Uh, uh, California, Florida, um, Indiana, yeah. Virginia, everywhere. They uh, wherever. So they would be vi they would be visited. And uh, David Wilson lives in Stonington, Connecticut, and he liked to call from time to time. Did any did anyone tell or suggest you that you should be careful using your phones other than your counsel after your brother fled? Specifically, did Kevin Weeks? Uh, indicate that you should be careful in investigators. Yeah, I don't think I ever spoke. To, I don't think he ever said a word to me, Kevin. I don't think he. I don't think he even. Does he say he did? I don't. I, he never spoke to me about that. When did you first meet Kevin Weeks? Um, well, I know his brother Jack. Jack was active in the national campaign. He was a a lead person or something in the Dukakis campaign. So I know the family uh, from, uh, they, they did not live too far from me. I don't think I knew Kevin very well until uh, later I would see him around occasionally. So the circumstance under, under which you might have a discussion with Kevin Weeks would be in person or on the phone, or what was the nature of those uh, communications? Um, I don't think Kevin ever, Weeks ever called me. Occasionally he would come by, I think because there was just absolutely no place else to go, and he'd chat with me. When did you become aware that uh, Kevin Weeks was cooperating in the uh, investigation regarding James? Um, well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm uncertain of that, but it was, it, was, it was hugely publicized, so there was no mystery to it. So you didn't... Uh, how, when did you learn that he had been arrested and, and, and charged? Is that the same time you learned that he was cooperating? No. Did you know he was? Co did anyone tell you, or did you do you remember becoming aware that Kevin Weeks was cooperating with the investigation? No, but I, I think I saw it in the paper. I don't think anyone ever told me that. I don't think. So you you learned of it through the uh, the newspaper? I think so. This Thank you. Uh, we have a vote uh, pending, and the time on the side has expired. Mr. Delhunt, do you want to be right? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do these five minutes. I was following um, uh, Congressman Lynch's uh, line of uh, inquiry in terms of your relationship with a variety of uh, uh, federal uh, agents, 
and I will give this to your counsel during the break, and you can re review it, uh, and we'll inquire after, after we, re we return. I just want to be really clear that the first time that you realized that your brother uh, was an informant for the FBI was in 1997 when it appeared in the Boston Globe. No, well, they, um, we're referring, uh, Congressman, to a 1987 story where... Uh, right, but well, let me ask you this question then. Sure. When were you first aware that, or were you satisfied that, in fact, your brother was an informant? With when the, was I, I... I think I think one of the moments when I was confident that it must be so was when um, during the uh, preliminary proceedings in the federal court, Judge Wolf, that uh, someone, I think it was Fleming, uh, used it as a defense. So that would have been the late 90s? I think so. 97, 98? Yeah. Um, were you aware or did you learn subsequently uh, that, in fact, your brother had been an informant for the FBI since 1979. Since 1979? Correct. I think it's the first time I ever heard about That date. Uh, yeah. Well, let, let me indicate to you that there has been evidence before this committee mm -hmm. that John Conley uh, and John Morris cultivated James Bulger sure. as an informant in a 1979 approached uh, Jeremiah O'Sullivan to inform him uh, that your brother James was an informant for the FBI and that he should be given consideration in a particular case and that was done. That's been evidenced before this committee. Subsequently, in, and again, I want to inquire as to the uh, involvement of the federal authorities as it relates to the so-called 75 State Street. Right. And I'm not interested in the facts. I presume that you were interviewed. Uh, I don't know whether you appeared before a grand jury, but you were interviewed, I understand, by two uh, assistant U.S. attorneys. Right. As well as two uh, FBI agents that were present. Right. I'm, I'm sure there were other people beside those, um, uh, the two counsel, but the counsel Fine. did all the talking. And the statements that you made to them, you'll testify here today, uh, were to the best of your ability, the truth. Oh, sure. So that we can obviously refer to those if necessary. Sure. Uh, let me just digress and go back to... See, I, Mm -hmm. Can I, I just, can. Okay. When you were called in front of the grand jury and you indicate that your testimony uh, was released, mm -hmm. I share uh, my colleague's concern about that leak, uh, the purpose of that grand jury, the purpose of those questions, was it to seek assistance in the whereabouts of your brother? I think so. That was your understanding? That is Prior harboring and obstruction of justice were the two uh, matters that brought us there. Were you declared, were you in, did, was it indicated to you you were either a subject or a target of that investigation? No, I don't think so. So presuming that the purpose of the grand jury was to secure information as to the whereabouts of your brother, right. prior to your grand jury uh, testimony, were you interviewed by the FBI? Uh, the grand jury is in 2001. 2001? That's correct, yeah. If you have a memory, were you I interviewed by the FBI prior ever. to 2001 as to the whereabouts of your fugitive brother? I don't believe I was. You were not? I don't think I was. Are you aware that there is a, a, uh, a task force that was created for the sole purpose of apprehending your fugitive brother? I believe, yes, I am. And you were never inquired of by that task force prior to your grand jury testimony? 
I don't believe so, no. Was your brother uh, John, Jack, inquired of? If you know. I don't know. You indicated that your wife was inquired of this week? Last week. Last they, week. They were looking for her. With the purpose of determining the whereabouts of James Bulger? Correct. And your brother, what year did your brother flee the Commonwealth? 95. 1995. So eight years later, the FBI gets around to inquiring of you and your wife, in your case some six years, as to the whereabouts of your brother? That's the first direct effort, yeah. Do you have something prepared that you were about to read or submit to the, to the committee regarding a conversation mm -hmm. some Doyle had with... Uh, yeah. well, those were two um, FBI agents, Congressman, who came to the door last Wednesday a week ago. This is very if, brief. If, can, I, uh, can I just interrupt? We've got to get over to a vote. Let okay. me ask this. Mr. Will, this is a great time for us to take a break. Uh, their time has expired. We've indulged them a little extra time to, so they could have some continuity. Sure. What I'd like to do is take a 40-minute break. Uh, mm -hmm. If you'd like to, we can make sure you have lunch in the back and have some privacy and you prepare, you. allow you to read anything that you'd like to supplement at that point okay. when you come back and read anything into the record. And then we'll resume questioning a half an hour on our side and then a half an hour over on the Democratic side. Okay. The hearing will be a recess. Our coverage of this hearing will continue in a moment. And while they're in this break, a chance to tell you about some of our programming tomorrow on the C-SPAN networks. On Washington Journal tomorrow, a look at efforts to create a liberal radio network with Anita Drobny, chair of Anshell Media. Also, Massachusetts Senator Edward Kennedy on Medicare legislation, now under consideration in the Senate. Plus, Stephen Schwartz with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He'll talk about terrorist groups in Israel and the occupied territories, and who funds them. Washington Journal starts at 7 a.m. Eastern. Later in the day, FBI Director Robert Mueller will give a luncheon speech at the National Press Club. We'll have live coverage starting at 1 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. Now more of today's hearing on the FBI's use of informants in the case of Boston organized crime figure James Whitey Bulger. The House Government Reform Committee will continue to hear testimony from Mr. Bulger's brother, University of Massachusetts President William Bulger. This final portion is just over two hours.